so I freely and firmly admit to the fact that I've been kind of putting this video off because of a great deal of nervousness and my usual fear of being judged and made fun of and otherwise not being well received. However, uh, this is something I said I would do uh, quite, quite some time ago, actually, and this is something I owe it to my players in addition to my viewers who actually care about my D&D my, uh, &D campaign. This is my setting. Uh, this is not everything. This is not 100% of everything. In fact, I will go ahead and tell you flat out, some of the things I'm about to tell you over the course of however long this video is are mm, ill-conceived. Some of them are not quite correct or missing pieces of information. Some of them are flat out lies. However, everything I'm about to tell you is what is known in this setting, if you understand me. Uh, if you were to make if you were to make a brand new character in this setting, I would be like, okay, go watch this video, because this summarizes everything your character will know, and any individual details that you may know differently or think are different would depend on the individual, you follow me? So any given individual knows everything I'm about to tell you, and considers it to be the truth, <laughs> if you understand where I'm going with that. Huh. So... Second thing I want to get out here right off the bat is I've said this a thousand times, but I still get comments about this. Yes, I borrow names, and in some cases I borrow concepts. Uh, I make no apology about this whatsoever, any more than I would for you know doing a standard D and D campaign in a world of my own making. When I use, if I were to use you know goblins or uh, fairies or whatever in that setting, many of the species you will hear about are taken from the game Asheron's Call. That is actually deliberate. I don't want to spoil why. Even the party doesn't know why. Uh, I don't think anybody knows why, actually. But uh, there, are, there is actual reason for it. However, the biggest thing is the name of the continent, which is, which, is I'm, which is what I'm going to be describing to you. The world is known as Primus. And this world has a single moon and three... Uh, I'm sorry, two continents. <laughs> Excuse me. These continents are both fairly large, all things considered. Uh about the size of Asia, for all intents and purposes, or at least the continent that uh, all the action takes place on. I'm, I'm, I know I know I'm going to have a section later on about geography. I just want to get this out here right off the bat because I want to explain because this is actually important that when I when I use the term the world, I'm referring to the continent. This continent, Dareth, is what I call it. Yes, I know, is the primary continent of the entire campaign. So I just wanted to get that out there. Yes, I will be, you know, there are Mosvart, there are Olthoi, there are Lugians. Um, I have taken them and used them in my own setting in my own way. Uh, sometimes they're rather similar, sometimes they're not. I'm not going to apologize for that, though, because my reasons for doing so were sound, both for my own sake as a GM, because I have a bad memory for names, I've discussed this a thousand times, but also because of other reasons I can't discuss. Last thing, I'm going to be trying to put some timestamps in here so people can actually use this as a reference in the future and say, you know, I want to hear about the blah. And so they can skip forward and click the little timestamp thing I'm going to be putting in the uh, comments section of here. Uh, which means I need to pull up the timer because I was about to start the first section. I will not be starting with the history. In fact, the history is the very last thing I'll be talking about because... The history, if I were to start with the history, there would be no sections. I would just be discussing the history, and every sentence I would pause and say, okay, let me explain, blah, 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 explain, explain, explain. So rather than do that, I have decided to explain everything else, and then rewind and say, okay, here's the history of the world. And the order I have chosen to do these in is very deliberate to create a kind of flow of consciousness. Uh, at least that makes sense to me, so shrug, I suppose. So the very first thing we're going to be discussing is, naturally, the clans. Within this setting, there are no surnames in the strictest sense of the word, although I suppose you could say that the clan name and the surname are basically uh, the same concept. The way it works is everyone had a clan name that they kept and held true to back at the year zero. I'll describe that much later. And... Every single member of... Okay, actually, I'm going to take a step back here. There are many clans. 
This is a continent that that is about the size of Asia. I mentioned this before. So when I say there are five or six or eight clans across an entire species, I do hope you get across the point that we're talking about millions of individuals who are all part of the same clan. The clan name does not denotate blood. In fact, actually, uh, it has almost nothing to do with familial relations from a cultural perspective, from, a, from that kind of a mindset. However, the clans are incredibly important to any given person, any given individual, and dictate almost everything I could talk about culturally and societally, both with the individuals and the races and the kingdoms and just everything, right? A clan name is a, a notifier of who you are. 99% of the time when someone introduces themselves or is talking about themselves or someone else, when their name comes up, they will not say, my name is Torith. They will say, my name is Torith of Whispersphere. My name is Torith of, you know, Dragonmar, whatever the heck. Uh, I'm sorry, those aren't... I think one of those is actually a clan name. I should probably... I have a list of clan names for all the species, uh, which I use and try to keep track of explicitly. And that is incredibly important. You know, if you ever reach the point where someone is using just the first name, you are implying a level of familiarity that, if forced, is considered extremely rude and practically it is just generally insulting it's literally like you're telling someone that they are half of who they actually are clan names are incredibly important to these people now as you might imagine as a result of that there is a great deal of cultural and societal balance around the clan names for example what happens when two members from different clans marry well the results actually completely vary based not only on the races but far more importantly on the individuals one given coupling of elves may have a completely different opinion on how to deal with their clan names merging than another coupling of elves. In some cases, they will actually keep their different clan names, and then they'll have a different issue when they have children, and having to decide which clan those children to belong to. But all of this is important. Let me, let me re-emphasize the gravitas of this. This is all something that is very important to just about everybody. So... It's never something to be taken lightly. Now, on top of that, when someone... Okay, let me give you a specific example. I've already mentioned this in the D&D blog. There was a knoll named Ironpaw who took a large number of knolls who were sick of being used by the Stonehold forces as uh, cheap, cheap enforcement, basically, and said, no, we're going to go and find a different life. He claimed the, the clan name of Wildpaw, which was his clan, right? He, he, continued to stay, he, he continued to keep the clan name of Wildpaw. Even though the Wildpaw have such a terrible reputation, even though they are known as vicious and violent brutes, it was such a part of his identity that he refused to abandon that just because other people use it differently than he does, if you understand where I'm going with this. Now, when he left, he took a lot of gnolls with him. Many of these gnolls did not actually have to change their clan name, but all of them did, because every single one of them symbiotically and literally were leaving everything else behind. And so they changed their clan name, in many cases, to Wildpaw, as a sign of the fact that they are now part of this tribe that Ironpaw is leading, and that they are now segregate from whatever they were before. You understand? That's the significance. It, it's kind of one of those things that only has signif as much significance as you, put, as you put into it, but the people of this setting put a great deal of significance into the clan names. Let me give you another example. In the future, the group will encounter, encounter a group called the Black Brine, okay? The Black Brine Bandits. These... Well, I'm not going to go into too much detail about them, but suffice it to say, they're a big group, okay? That's, imp that's the important part. When someone joins the Black Brine, of course they keep their existing clan name, until a point in time at which they and their fellow crew, uh, they're primarily sea-based, decide that that new member has not acclimated, not been assimilated, but been accepted into the new family. If it's not obvious, the whole concept here of clans is very uh, much based on my own beliefs about family. I've, I've often said family is not about blood, it's about choice. That's very much where this clan thing is coming from. Thus, when a member has believes he is no longer, you know, a dwarf of Anvilmar, he believes he has now truly become a member of this family, of his new family, of the Blackbrine, he will change his last name, he will change his clan name to 
dwarf of Blackbrine, you understand? Now that's not a true clan per se, because, you know, duh, but it's still a significant point, and obviously you could say, well, anybody could do that at any time, but if they did it at any time, A, it would have basically no significance, and B, they would be obviously outed as false. The other Blackbrine would say, oh, you just changed your name immediately after joining, huh? Well then. And there's a good chance that person might be run out of the Blackbrine, because that's not the kind of person they want there, you understand? It has such significance. So much significance that when, in the example I said, you know, the dwarf who changes it, they would throw a party. They would throw a celebratory feast for that one dwarf. I'm talking just a guy who happens to swab decks on a boat. And yet the whole of that ship and all its members and its captain and everything would go down and, and put in, make birth and say, okay, we're going to celebrate. Why? Because dwarf over here is now of Blackbrine. And we have another member of our family. That's basically where the clans are. Now, there are a couple of exceptions here I want to talk about specifically. This is kind of blurring into the races section, which is kind of why I put that next, so forgive me. But there are a few exceptions that are worth noting. Number one, mites. Mites have no clans. They never have, they never will. Mites do not have clan names. Mites do not have surnames, for that matter. Mites are simply mites. And I'll explain the mentality of wheres and the whys and the wherefores later, but the important part is they don't they understand that mentality of the family thing, they just don't buy into it at all. There is no such thing as loyalty amongst family within the mites. Now I'm not saying that's a you know, that they don't care about their parents. And I'll get more into that when I talk about the mites later, so just just bear with me for now. Second thing that's really important, half elves. Uh I'll t again, I'll discuss what a half elf is later on. But a half-elf is always, well, okay, 90% of the time, given the choice when they reach of age to choose their clan name. Because they're kind of a unique exception, uh, unlike the elf and elf uh, example I gave earlier. A half-elf is a elf breeding with someone else. Now, if you've been paying attention, humans are not basically a part of this setting. Uh, they have only very, very recently become a part of this setting, or at least the, a part of Dareth. So, you get where I'm going with this. I'll discuss that more when I get to half-elves. Another thing is fairies. Fairies are not birthed in any sense of the word. Uh, not really. I'll dis Again, I'll discuss that more when I get later. But fairies do not have clan names at all. They have no clan affiliation. They literally don't have families, unlike mites, which do actually have mothers and, and fathers. Fairies don't. So, obviously, they, they don't have anything approaching uh, clan names or clan association. Uh, the next one would be the lycanthropes. Uh, I will discuss lycanthropes later, but again, suffice it to say, they do not have clan names. On very, very rare occasions, a lycanthrope will say they are of House Blah, whatever house they serve within the Derekost, but that's, that's as far as that will go. The final real exception here is the Olthoi. Now, the Olthoi, I will explain the whys and the wherefores when I get to them. And it's the race I am most proud of in this setting, believe it or not. But suffice it to say, the Olthoi, as an attempt to acclimate to the rest of the, of the culture of all the other races, use their brood name as their clan name. So, for example, Kazrinthka, who the party just met, is Kazrinthka of Worker, the Worker Brood, even though, for all intents and purposes, it is not a clan name in any strictest sense of the word. She still uses it like one because she understands just how important clan names are to everyone else. It doesn't actually have uh, any importance to her, if you understand what I mean. So, those are all the exceptions with regards to clans. Now, let's go ahead and move on to the races. Uh, whoops, what's our time here? There we go. We'll start with the basics, elves. Now in my setting, elves are what humans would be in most settings. They are varied, they are generic, they are average, they are all over the place, they are multifaceted, they can do whatever. They have, they have long ears, of course. <laughs> um, they could be of just about any skin color. Uh, well, okay, any normal skin color, you know. Uh, any, any human skin color that you see in, in real life today, you can see in an elf. And their hair colors are all very normal, of course. They do not live particularly long, an average of 90 years. They do speak Elven. They do uh, basically run 
a large portion of the world. Uh, statistically speaking, they probably won the largest portion, if you were to put it that way. However, that's kind of being misleading, because that's assuming that all the elves are united, which obviously they are not. But elves tend to pretty much be the predominant species throughout all of the Kingdom of Alluvia. Like, I'll discuss the nations later, which is probably considered to be the largest kingdom of the various uh, organizations that have territory across Dareth. The elves have a long-standing series of, I wouldn't even call them violent grudges, so much as cultural grudges. You know, that kind of uh, almost Stepford Wife, uh, that, that's a bad way to put it. The, the kind of, you know, we have to show the Joneses kind of a thing. We have to prove that we are better than the other clans kind of a thing. Uh, Inter-clan rivalry, there's a, actually a great deal of it, to the point where, you know, for example, if a member of... I don't know, where's my clan name list? Give me just a moment here. Because I actually do have the specific uh, rivalries written down. I have a great deal of notes, as, as you kind of have to for a setting this large. Did you know I spent over a year and a half working on this setting? Solid, by the way. Not, you know, oh, I worked here. No, I really did. Okay, here we go, elves. Uh, for example, the Moodblade clan has a great deal of, of aggravation with the Lightmain clan. The Wolfrunner clan has a great deal of aggravation with the Nightsong clan. The Feathermoon clan cannot stand the Wintersong clan, and so forth and so on. To the point where, like, if someone from Wintersong and Feathermoon wanted to marry, for, you know, whatever reason, there is a decent chance that they might actually be disowned uh, by their parents as a result of that. Because th they just do not care for that sort of thing. It is also worth noting that the elves have a great deal of rivalry with the Lord Elves, which I'll be discussing next. That rivalry is basically one way, a.k.a. the elves can't stand the Lord Elves, and the Lord Elves just kind of deal with it. It doesn't help that the Lord Elves' title is kind of arrogant in the beginning, but there's reasons for that, which I, of course, will not be telling you. Um, so, let's see. I actually can't think if there's anything else to say about the elves. They are the melting pot of my setting. So let's go ahead and move on to Lord Elves. Lord Elves, in contrast, have very, uh, I like to call, call it as basically stony skin. That is to say, if you've ever seen basalt, or alabaster, or uh, quartz, that's the kind of skin they have. It's always uh, a monotone. It always is a shade of gray, I should say. It will never be anything other than black, white, or some version of gray in between. And it always looks like it's literally stone, uh, if you understand where I'm going with that. They are much taller than standard elves. They also live longer. In fact, people aren't 100% sure what their average lifespan is. There are also many, many, many fewer of them. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier... Well, okay. Lord elves can't breed with any other race except for lord elves. What the hell? So, it is worth noting that the lord elves basically have... A, a, a restricted gene pool, if you understand what I mean. Um, well, okay, no, actually, I'm sorry, I'm actually screwing this up. Damn, that phone call really messed me up. Lord Elves can breed with any standard humanoid race. However, the children will always be Lord Elves. Lord Elves can breed with each other, of course, but that will also produce more Lord Elves. Um, that's why they haven't died out. And they, nobody has ever actually sufficiently explained this phenomenon to this day. But, moving right along, the Lord Elves uh, generally have kind of a bad reputation, which is basically undeserved. Despite their term, they are often seen as arrogant or prideful, when in fact it, they're no more arrogant or prideful than any other individual race. Otherwise, basically, for all intents and purposes, everything I said about Elves you could apply to them, other than the changes in how they uh, procreate and their appearance. The Lord Elves uh, also have been increasing in numbers uh, basically forever, and the reasons why should be obvious. Wh where that will go, I guess we'll see as time goes on. Give me just a second, I do apologize. I gotta respond to this, because someone is in trouble, and hopefully this will help. Not serious trouble, don't worry. So... Half-elves would be next. 
Now a half elf is a refer can refer to it's it's not a, so much a species as it is a classification. Elves, regular elves, can breed with virtually every other race. So there are half elf, you know, dwarves, there are half elf gnomes, there are half elf trolls, there are half elf banderlings, there are half elf ogres, there are half elf orcs, there are half elf moorsmen, there are half elf lugians, there are half elf drudges and half-elf kobolds, half-elf goblins, half-elf... Uh, actually, I believe I've reached the end of the list. Uh, so there's a possibility of a, ha of a, a half-elf being elf and the other thing. In general, they accept being called half-elves. As I mentioned back in my clans thing, uh, for obvious reasons, the choice that is usually granted to them to choose a clan name is a big deal, and uh, when they get that choice, what age, varies wildly. Their own uh, life expectancy varies wildly depending on the uh, other race, the race that isn't elf. Half elves are also nowhere near as populous as any of the other races I've mentioned. Again, I, I hate to even call them a race because it really isn't accurate, but you get the point. So, you don't actually see them all that often, but when you do, it's always distinctive too. They do, you know, a half elf who is half elf, half banderling will still have fur and whiskers and a few things like that, a few features as if, you know, to distinguish them. A half-elf, uh, you know, moorsman will have these scales kind of starting to come out of their skin. Uh, not scales, but, you know, the spikes and the ridges and the stronger uh, cranium, you know, that kind of a thing. So the half-elves also have a... I wouldn't even call it a thing, but suffice it to say that half-elves and lord-elves really don't get along. Again, this probably is just because of cultural prejudice, but suffice it to say that half-elves really, really don't like lord-elves, and they tend to think of lord-elves as, if you'll forgive me, lording it over them, the fact that they can breed perfectly every time, whereas the half-elves always come out as mongrels. And by the way, for anyone who's curious, yes, you can have a, you know, a ha an elf breeds with a orc, so you get a half-elf, half-orc, and then that half-elf, half-orc, you know, 30 years later, breeds with an orc, which makes a more orcish elf. You get the point. There's a lots of gradients here. In fact, in my racial stats, uh, if you choose to play a half-elf, your stats literally depend on how much you are of one and the other, and you have to pick what your other uh, race is, for obvious reasons. Next we have the dwarves. I gotta be honest, I got very little to say about the dwarves. If anybody has ever seen TV tropes, you know that there's a thing that says, you know, our elves are different, our angels are different, our demons are different, our vampires are different. And then there's one that says, our dwarves are the same. That's because dwarves usually are the same. And frankly, I didn't feel like rocking the boat. My dwarves are pretty much dwarves. If you've ever seen a dwarf in anything, you've pretty much seen a dwarf in mine. Uh, the only exception to this, and, and I suppose this actually could be considered a large exception, but whatever is the fact that dwarves in my setting are not inclined towards things like, uh, for example, blacksmithing, or mining, or uh, any of the other stereotypes. For all intents and purposes, a dwarf in my setting, other than his temperament and his stubbornness, or her, as the case may be, is no more or less inclined to be anything other than an elf. They are probably the second most common race uh, in the entire northeastern quadrant of the continent, and you could find them anywhere. You could find them working, you know, the docks. You could find them working in a shop. You could find them as a blacksmith. You could find them as a tailor. You could find them as a mage, you know. There's no particular restriction there. Dwarves are just people, and they're kind of a melting pot for all intents and purposes. Um, then we have gnomes. Now, I mentioned this on the stream, so I admit this to you freely. Gnomes in my setting are World of Warcraft gnomes, pretty much copy-pasted. All the exuberance, all the enthusiasm, all the slightly manic and slightly crazy lack of uh, regard for personal safety is very much these gnomes, because I've always loved WoW gnomes. They're the only gnomes I've ever liked in all of fiction ever. They, The gnomes in my setting like, it, are everything I just described. You know, they are exuberant, they are energetic they are yeah and they've always got some idea and it's always and there's always just a slight tinge of craziness to them and i'm not talking crazy like you know or whatever just you know it doesn't occur to them that someone might be worried about the fact that that device they're de they're working on might explode one tenth of the time why would that why would that bother you it's just one tenth of the time we're all going to be good you'll live through it 
You didn't really need those ten fingers, did you? What? Um, gnomes are also incredibly intelligent in my setting. Uh, this is admittedly partially bo borrowed from WoW, but also because it made most sense to me. There are three races uh, that you could basically call the pushers of innovation in my setting, and gnomes are one of them. Virtually all of the major technological and magical innovations of the last uh, two centuries you could attribute to gnomes and the other two races, which I'll get to shortly. Gnomes also... Uh, really, 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 really stick to clan names a lot. Uh, it is incredibly rare that gnomes will have children or get married outside of their clan. Really, really rare. They really stick to the bloodline, familial uh, traditions of their clan, and there's a great deal of competition between the clans that they adhere to, even to this day. Now, of course, I'm not talking about martial uh, competition, or at least not most of the time. But still, you know, you if you if you're a clan, uh, well, hang on, let me just pull up the list here again. If you're from Clan Great Gear, you better believe that you are going to prove that you can make way way better stuff than Clan uh, Full Throttle can, for example. We're going to just show those guys. You understand? <laughs> so let's go ahead and move on to fairies. Now, fairies in my setting are <laughs> practically uh, brand new. Uh, they're probably the only race that, basically, if I, I made the name, you know, Flabidicla, it would be the same thing, because there's basically no connotation to fairies, other than the fact that they have wings. And that's not really a big thing. Give me, I'm sorry, give me just a second, I gotta text this person again. I was not expecting to be interrupted tonight. There we go. Fairies in my setting... Okay. I will discuss later about the elements and how important they are to everything. This is a very elemental world. Suffice it to say, fairies are pretty much literally birthed from the elements. There is this massive pool uh, near this in, in the city of Arwick, which is the fairy capital. And from this pool, periodically, a fairy will just walk out, completely fully grown adu adult, right? Now, this fairy will have basic generic knowledge of speaking, you know, uh, being able to talk, what food is, you know, general adult knowledge of existing, but they won't have knowledge of, you know, for example, math, or, well, math is a bad example, but they won't have knowledge of, like, history, or science, or, you know, uh, literature. They will have knowledge of how to live, how to exist. Now... It is such a rare occurrence uh, that a new fairy is born that it is considered a event of some celebration every time it happens. And new fairies are usually greeted by several other fairies who tend the pool, basically, and immediately taken care of and watched after. There's a, there's a huge ritual involved, which I'm not going to detail to you, uh, but I have thought about it, because it's me, of course. It, that is basically them, you know, acclimating them to, okay, you are now alive, this is the world, we are your people, there are other people, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, fairies are not born with the night knowledge of other uh, species, so, a so almost always they try to isolate new fairies until they're, you know, comfortable with themselves, comfortable with social interactions and cultural interactions with the fairies, and then they'll be like, okay, so there's a few dozen other races walking around on the planet with us. So... Etc. Etc. Right now, when uh, fairies have wings, I mentioned that they are fairly tall. This is the this is the fact that always surpri uh, surprises everyone. They are six feet uh, at the low end, and more like uh, seven and a half feet on the high end. They can use their wings to fly at us sometimes. It depends on the fairy, and it depends on how uh, experienced they are. That does, in game terms, uh, pretty much directly relate to level. But for all intents and purposes, if you are a you know, an old fairy, for all intents and purposes, you can actually uh, learn to fly after a while. Even, however, younger fairies can learn how to hover for a few seconds on their wings. But the, eva the to do so is very tiring. Fairies uh, cannot have children uh, at all. Fairies, however, do have romantic relations. It's actually quite common, not just with other fairies, but with other races as well. I mention that because certain people took issue with that when I first mentioned that. I'll get to that more when I get to lycanthropes, but suffice it to say that I felt it was worth mentioning. The fairies do believe in romantic connection without regards to procreation. Um, 
However, they cannot. They are literally, biologically, physically, mentally, emotionally, magically <laughs> incapable of procreating. Now, of course, what can and does happen is sometimes couples, either fairy fairies or fairies and other uh, species, will adopt children, because adoption is certainly a thing, right? Because they want to have some kind of a family. But it is probably obvious now, in hindsight, why fairies do not have clans, why fairies never take clans. They just are whoever they are. Oh, by the way, when they're birthed from the, tool, the pool, they are named. Uh, I should put this properly. They know their name when they walk out of the pool. No one's 100% certain who gives them or what gives them their name, but they, it's just this generally considered acceptable knowledge that they are named by the pool or by the elements themselves. Um, culturally speaking... The fairies come across as a little bit on the naive side, mainly because most fairies don't actually live all that long, all things considered. And uh, and I don't mean because their lifespans, because their lifespans are actually very, very long, probably one of the longest lifespans of all the races. However, they tend to get killed often because fairies uh, oftentimes don't fully understand the dangers of the world. On top of that... Fairies tend to not f uh, tend to be only as good as they are trained is the way I want to put that because for example I will talk about the uh, the zephyrs later on and the zephyrs is is uh, manned entirely by fairies it's an entire fairy organization and their entire purpose is acting as diplomats in order to help uh, expedite and uh, assist with you know diplomacy. Uh, trade negotiations, uh, social faux pas, smoothing overs, you know, that kind of a thing, right? However, th they have a long and versed history in doing so, and not that many people like to admit this, but actually the Zephyrs were founded by a Lord Elf, and that Lord Elf, uh, that's actually Elissa, specifically went out of her way to train the first fairies of the Zephyrs very, very, very well in diplomacy. And fairies are extremely good learners if they if very slow learners. Do you understand what I mean? They take forever to learn something, but once they do, they're set. They will never forget it, and they will be good at it forever. So, the Zephyrs have always maintained this reputation for excellence because, even though it takes years uh, over a decade, actually, of training and teaching, once they're done, they're done. You understand? They don't have to do continuing education if you understand what I mean. Give me one more second. I do apologize. I do hope this works. All right, next on the list is trolls. Now, a lot of people look at me really weird uh, when they see that trolls is on not only on the major list of races, but the playable list of uh, races. Of uh, Naturally, that's because most people think of D&D trolls, and that's fine. Trolls in my setting are hard to define as a people. Uh, in a similar way, you'll notice this, I'll, I'll say this as well about uh, one additional race uh, down the list, so forgive me for repeating myself, but trolls are just people, just like elves, just like dwarves, uh, orcs is the other one. Trolls don't really have anything really defining them as far as a culture from the other races per se. Any given troll is just as likely to do any given role in society as any other, you know, common uh, race. The trolls, however, do tend to get along really, really well with races outside of Navarre, uh, which is where they primarily reside. No one's 100% sure why, but trolls tend to acclimate to the culture, the society, the economies, the, the you know, little interactions of, you know, Lugians and Bur Burun and uh, elves much better than, say, the Banderlings or the Ogres do. So oftentimes trolls will be used uh, in a position of basically an envoy or a trader or a merchant or a messenger or what have you because they simply get along better with everyone. Trolls have a 
really strange viewpoint on the whole clan thing. I shouldn't say strange, that, that's being disingenuous. Trolls believe that a clan name should only be changed under truly volatile circumstances. For example, um, a troll who joins the Black Brine, I mentioned that specific example earlier, would take an extremely long time, much, much longer than any other race, to change his clan name to Black Brine. If he changed it at all, by the way, he might not. He might retain his clan name the whole time. Furthermore, when a child is born of a clan, uh, even if it's of two different clans, oftentimes it will actually devolve into literal physical fighting between the parents as to which clan name the child will take. And, interestingly enough, that clan name can be challenged by the child when the child reaches of age, which is actually uh, 14 for trolls, by the way. Trolls don't actually live all that long uh, compared to the other races. However, they do have the regenerative abilities that have their own purposes in my setting. I'm not giving you stats. Uh, obviously, this is all about the setting and the flavor and the lore, so forgive me. Next race, the Banderlings. The Banderlings are basically uh, tall with the... I, I don't actually remember the name. There's a proper name for it. They have the backwards goat leg thing on their uh, their legs where the bone goes back and then forward instead of forward and back like we have. There's a proper name for that, and I actually can't think of it off the top of my head. They are obviously furred. They are basically... Uh, I, I'd say they're cat people, but that's being uh, too generic. Honestly, the Bandolings are kind of hard to describe. I saw a picture once a long time ago almost three years ago, and I saved it just because it really stuck with me. It was a just a fan art of some random uh, bandit that happened to be slightly feline. And I stress that because it obviously wasn't a cat person. And that basically became what I visually think of as the Banderlings. I've shared this picture with several of my players, so they know what I'm talking about. Um, so forgive me for not really describing them visually all that well. Banderlings are usually very tall, very agile, very uh, thin, very muscular. Uh, thin muscular, if you understand what I mean by that, as opposed to, you know, bulk muscle. They just obviously have very uh, limber and long limbs. They uh, pretty much are the dominant race in all of Navarre, much more so than even the elves. You know, the elves are probably, I'd say, 40, maybe 30-ish percent of Alluvia. The Banderlings are probably more like 60 percent of Navarre. The Banderlings... Play, are much more pragmatic than most of the other races I've mentioned thus far. Thus far. Uh, for example, on the clan subject, a Banderling really has no problem changing his clan name. Well, okay, relatively speaking, obviously there will still be a major event, but will have much less of an issue uh, changing his or her clan name than uh, someone of another race would, at least if there's a reason to do so, of course. Banderlings also tend to be really good at, of all things, merchant merchandising, economy, money issues. And there's a reason that Navarre is the trade nation, for all intents and purposes, because the Bandolings have built this entire confederacy out of basi basically out of a trade empire. What started as a few merchant groups grew into guilds, grew into uh, corp uh, conglomerates, which grew into states, which then banded together and formed the Navarre Confederacy. That's pretty much all the drive of the Banderlings. Now, there is one other thing really important about the Banderlings specifically. They are very progressive, and I've probably mentioned that based on everything I've said before. You know, very economically driven, very uh, very ambitious, and not really being held back by uh, preconceived notions. I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just mentioning it because it will be important for things that are coming up. But the Banderlings are probably the second most progressive race, uh, all things considered, in the whole of the of the setting. Next we have the ogres. Now again, sometimes people look at me weird when they hear ogres. The ogres are basically human-looking, for all intents and purposes, except obviously much larger and much taller, but not to the extremes that they sometimes reach in some games and some settings. They are uh, not as big as Lugians, for example. They usually top out at about 8 feet, whereas a Lugian will start, you know, the short Lugian will be 7 feet. The ogres... Uh, do have a little bit of a bad reputation for being stupid, but ironically, the ogres specifically, for many, many, many generations, have been intentionally playing to that, if you understand what I mean. Ogres actually are very cunning and very intelligent in their own way. They're not like book smart, they aren't technological smart, they aren't scientific smart, but they are very cunning, they are very good at thinking on their feet, and they are very good at uh, 
huge turning situations to their advantage. And so they've been playing this dumb act uh, pretty much as a race for just about forever because it's advantageous to them. Now, obviously, I'm speaking in generics. There are ogres who don't bother, and there are some ogres who don't care. And there are, of course, ogres who are dumb. You know, just like there's dumb everyone, except mites. But point being, uh, that's basically where they're at. The ogres... Uh, Mm. The ogres have an interesting thing. I, I, I'm probably going to be accused of making this very Klingon, uh, but it was not by design. Let's just say an ogre of... Here, let me pull up my ogre list here. An ogre of Deadwind, the, the clan Deadwind, and an ogre of the clan Splinterfist both want to marry. Well, in order to do that, they both have to team up against a certain number, usually four-ish, of champions, warriors, etc., you know, people who can fight, of each clan, so eight total. And those two have to beat those eight. Now here's the interesting thing. Who wins isn't actually relevant. Once they're done, there will be no hard feelings whatsoever. There will be no anything. By the way, this is obviously not a fight to the death. Uh, this, the whole point of this exercise is to, for the two to prove that they have the commitment necessary, physically, literally, in order to be together. And so, you know, if they go up against the eight and they're destroyed instantly, don't even bring down a single person, then they're going to be denied the right to marry, usually. And, in, in, uh, you know what, I mean, I'm actually saying that wrong. They will probably give up their plans of marriage themselves without external stimuli because they think they're not good enough to marry each other. You understand where I'm going with this? But if they find a mate that they are strong enough with in order to put up a fight, even if they take it one or two of those eight people, they have proven that they have strength together that they wouldn't have alone, and there will be this celebration, and there will be a feast, and there will be partying, and all that sort of thing, and everyone will just be like, yeah, this is great. By the way, ogres are also probably the brewers of my setting. Um, most settings have one species that just makes the best and the most most strongest uh, alcohol. That is definitely the ogres in my setting. They are excellent brewers, and they tend then they tend to very jealously guard their secrets. And they have entire, uh, basically the equivalent of Oktoberfest uh, festivals, but more than one a year, where they just get, you know, they, they get the whole thing set up, and they get the whole uh, festival set up, and it's just, just booze, and food, and meat, and cheese, and yeah! And there's always uh, healers and uh, white mages on, on hand, because ogre brew is really strong, and some races just can't handle it. Like, not even a sip, if you understand what I mean. Uh, I actually had end up having uh, one of my players, a human took like three sips, I think, from an ogre brew, and I told him, okay, look, I want you to roleplay the fact that you are more smashed than you've ever been smashed in your life. He did a great job of it, credit to him, that's Rory, for anyone who's curious. Um, but yeah, that's the ogres for you. Sorry I talked about that for a while, but I spent a little while on the ogres. The orcs, by contrast, I spent almost no time at all on, because again, they're just kind of there. The elves, the dwarves, the uh, trolls, and the orcs are basically just people. Now, orcs do have, uh, did, I really should say past tense, have a tendency to be ambitious more. And I mean personally ambitious, not, you know, I want to be in charge of a corporation, or I want to be the head of a guild. But I want to be someone who has these things to my name. You know, I have accomplished these deeds. This has led many or orcs, uh, statistically speaking, more than anyone else, to become adventurers back in the day. I'll discuss adventurers almost towards the end of this whole video, so don't worry. But orcs, uh, that's pretty much the only thing I could say for orcs, all things considered. However, mo orcs also, this is important, started the tradition of abandoning clan names when you became an adventurer. Again, I'll talk about that when I get to the adventurer section. But that whole thing came from orcs. And now let's move on to the Burun. Uh, actually, I'm going to take a step back. I, I want to say something real quick. Elves, lord elves, half elves, dwarves, gnomes, fairies, all basically exist within Alluvia. Obviously, there are some elsewise, but that's their primary residence, right? Trolls, banderlings, ogres, and orcs are primarily within Navarre. The next three species are primarily within the Sho Empire, this, and the first one being the Burun. The Burun are uh, large toad-like creatures who uh, kind of waddle about on their feet. Very, very magically gifted. Uh, very... 
patient is actually the word I want to use. I would not call them wise, and I would not call them intelligent. But a uh, Burun will be much, much more patient than most other races. Burun are also extremely long-lived, probably the second, I'm sorry, third most long-lived race uh, of all of them. I guess fourth, because Ulthoi and Lycanthropes are tied, but whatever. Burun will live four centuries if allowed to. Now, Burun also have a very... This is a cultural thing and not a racial thing, because there are exceptions. They have a very built-in arrogance. Uh, and it's a type of arrogance I always have a trouble describing, because when most people think of arrogance, they think, you know, huh, huh, I'm better than you. But it's a different type of arrogance than, you know, someone who says, I am better than you. And then there's the type of arrogance where someone n thinks, knows, I should say, actually, no, that, that's the way I want to put it, knows they're better than you. They don't say anything about it. It's just assumed. And if you, and obviously you're going to be inferior to them, so they don't even say anything. The only time they will even bring it up is if you don't act inferior to them, in which case they will be surprised. Now, that actually does not ascribe to all races uh, equally. There's this whole ridiculously complicated... Uh, basically political ranking system, for lack of a better way to put it, that the Burun have for their society. And I'm not going to bore you with it here, even though I actually bet some of you would love to hear it. I spent quite a while, uh, long time on it. The long and the short of it is the entire show empire is run by the Burun. Burun are the ones who are in charge of the merchant guilds, are in charge of the military, are in charge of the economics, are in charge of the dip diplomatics, are in charge of the bureaucracy, are in charge of the ships. You, you get the point. It is also very common, especially nowadays, for, for example, let's say, there, let's, let's use the guild example. There's an excellent uh, fisherman's guild that a Burun one runs, right? But that Burun doesn't actually do anything. He happens to hold the title to it, and he gets the money from it, which he distributes, of course. But it, the person actually running the place, the person actually in charge, is his servant, a Moorsman, for example. And so the Moorsman is basically, for all intents and purposes, the one actually running that entire guild. However, the Burun is the one on the top of the pile. Do you understand where I'm going with this? One final thing. I mentioned earlier that the Banderlings are very progressive, the second most progressive race, after Lugians. The Burun are the most traditionalist. They haven't changed the laws in several of their cities, and in fact in their entire empire, in, in ever in some cases. Obviously some have changed. But there are, for example, there's a specific law that says no building in the entirety of Shoshi can be taller than the Emperor's building. The Emperor's building is three stories tall, and it has never been changed. So Shoshi is a huge city because it had to spread out because it couldn't go up. You understand where I'm going with this? There's one other reason this is important. The Sho Empire does have an airship fleet. It is impossible, uh, from an engineering perspective, to have an airship dock that is shorter than three stories tall. So there is no airship dock in Shoshi. That is how obstinate and stubborn they are about not changing uh, their traditions, their laws, their mindsets, their philosophies, etc. Now, of course, there are exceptions. Don't mistake me. But I wanted to get that across because that is primarily the Burun pushing that. Now, next race, again, part of the show, would be the Moorsmen. The Moorsmen are hard to describe because Moorsmen are often very humble, very uh, polite, very dignified. But other than that, there's not a few many tr uh, features that really define them. They're very... Uh, they have very ridged, uh, they're, they're, ver they're, almost, they're barely humanoid for all intents and purposes. You could call them fish people uh, if the, instead of fish they had uh, carpuses, uh, like a uh, crab for, or something like that. Except don't picture a crab. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm failing miserably here. They have, an out they have an exoskeleton, and they have very large wide eyes and scaled uh, skin. It's not actually skin, but you get the point that, uh, because the carapace isn't smooth, I shouldn't have used crab. A better example would be a, if you look at a very thick lizard hide, you know, with all the, the, like an iguana or something like that, imagine that, except that is actually their exoskeleton. That's basically where a Moorsman's at, and they are, uh, they are bipedal. 
but they hunch over because moorsmen are actually quite tall if they actually stand up properly. And their spine curves forward a great deal. So their heads are actually lower than, or you know, their faces, I should say, are actually lower than the top of their necks, if you understand where I'm going with this. Moorsmen are the basically the middle class of the show empire. They do a lot of the actual work, and as such, Moorsmen tend to get very experienced and even command a great deal of respect, all things considered. Now here's the weird part. Moorsmen are obviously lesser than, sh than the Burun, right? I mentioned that. But they are also, they're not like slaves. They are not looked down upon such as they are not worth anything, I guess is where I'm going to go with this. Quite the contrary, it is actually considered a huge boon to have a Moorsman working for you as a Burun that is very skilled or very well sought after, you know, because the Moorsmen themselves tend to become very skilled at whatever they do. They learn, by contrast to the fairies, they learn very, very quickly. Moorsmen can become skilled in things in a fraction of the time of what any other race can, with the exception of the mites. And Moorsmen tend to get, tend to really just, and they don't tend to stop, if you understand what I mean. They tend to be perfectionists. They tend to actually work for the sake of work. They tend to enjoy work, is kind of where I'm going with this. And so they have this great uh, uh, cultural identity of, you know, we are the elite craftsmen. And that is one of the reasons why, the, for so many centuries, the Moorsmen have not, you know, pushed back against the Burun, who have been pushing down against them, because the Burun themselves do value them and do take care of them and pay them well and all that fun stuff. It is only very recently that the Moorsmen have finally started pushing and lobbying for uh, equal rights, but you can probably imagine where that's going. Next race is the Sklavi. Now, the Sklavi, I have tried to describe and failed many times. I want you to picture... Uh, someone, Ivan, once did a picture of his great picture. It was, it was probably the best thing I've seen uh, describing them for in a while. Picture a thin tall humanoid, a uh, human, and picture that you just chop that human's head off cleanly, no blood, you know, no gore here, just, just bear with me, okay? Now, replace all the skin with snake skin, you know, like, like on a snake, so, and replace the, everything from the neck up with a snake, the end of a snake, so, in other words, the snake head goes up, and then curves down, and then ends in the actual head, the neck part is, is like a snake, you understand where I'm going with this? Uh, that's where a Sklavi is at. Admittedly very based on the Sklavi from Ashron's Call, but bear with me for a moment. Mm. Unlike the... Oh, excuse me, I almost choked there. Unlike the Moorsmen, the Sklavi are not particularly well uh, treated amongst the show. They're, I would not go so far as to call them slaves, because slavery doesn't exist in my setting. Uh, with, well, ahem. <clears throat> but, um... The Sklavi are very much the worker class, not the craftsmen, like the Moorsmen are, you know, the the elite, the prestige. No, 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 no. I'm talking the guy with the hammer who's along with 17 of the guys who also have hammers who are just banging at the rock in the way that the Moorsmen told them to because the Burun directed the Moorsmen to. You understand the, the layering here? It's very caste-based and very racial uh, in, that way, in that sense. And the Sklavi very much have a constant sense of almost bitterness and resignation to it. But when I say uh, when I say that, try to understand that I don't mean, you know, if I was given a chance to rebel against my masters, I would do it in a heartbeat. Or, you know, something along the lines of, uh, I hate those Burons so much. It's more like, I, I stress that word resignation. The Sklavi pretty much are used to their lot in life and haven't really tried to change it uh, ever. In fact, uh, a Sklavi who is actually chosen for military service tends to consider that a good thing, even though they know that they will never actually as arise past a certain point in rank because they will never be allowed to because they are a Sklavi. They are still happy about actually being able to serve because it means they have risen slightly in the overall eyes of the Empire. It's a very downtrodden kind of thing. So the Sklavi uh, basically are only doing as well as they are because most, most, I gotta stress that, of the Burun aren't, and most, and the, all of the Moorsmen, for the moment, for the most part, are, are generally being pretty, uh, kind about the whole fact that they are the, the stepstool of the show empire, to put it as kindly as I can. 
that's an interesting situation, and there's plenty else going on there. I'm just not going to go into that. Uh, one other thing I do want to add, the Sklavi. I mentioned before that some races are really, really, really strict on their clan name. The Sklavi are one of them. Sklavi will not uh, marry or have family outside of their clan name. They are very proud of their clan name. It's one of the only things that they really say... Uh, it's one of the things that they say, you know, this is ours. This is not anyone else's, but my clan is mine. And our clan is ours. And we are not going to share our clan, even with other Sklavi, if you understand where I'm going with here. They're not so much as, you know, having uh, arguments or, or fights uh, between the clans, but the clans basically have been the same clans blood-wise for centuries. Now, there's one other thing I want to look at here real quick, because I'm almost positive. Yep, that's what I thought. Uh, there's one other thing I want to mention, uh, really brief, about the Sklavi. There are, of course, exceptions, and it is worth noting that Sklavi are really good in combat, just in general. They're one of the only races that are just plain built to fight. Uh, one of two, actually. The other would be gnolls, in case you're wondering. Thus, it is not that uncommon for a Sklavi who has joined the military to push past the glass ceiling by virtue of just being that good, if you understand what I mean. Even though most, uh, even though most Sklavi uh, in certain ranks... They, okay, there's this whole thing. I won't go into it now. Suffice it to say that, for example, there is technically, and i got to stress the word technically here, a show uh, count. Uh, count is in charge of a province who is a Sklavi. But he's not actually. He is actually, in fact, one of their the high military leaders of that particular section. He just happens to be qualified as a count based on the way the politics work. I'll get into that later. So that, that can happen. It's pretty much solely within the military, though. I'm, I'm only about halfway through my races. Lugians are next. Lugians are the giants. Now, Lugians can have pretty much any skin color under the under the sun. You you name a color, uh, other than like hot pink or neon or anything that's otherwise unnatural. You know, any natural color, like a lizard, for example. You you can see lizards of just about any color. And yes, I know you can see pink lizards. Um, that's that's where the Lugians are at. They are very tall. Like I said earlier, a short, a midget Lugian would be about seven feet tall. They usually average. Uh, closer to, I guess that would be 12-ish feet tall, and the taller Lugians can be well over 15 feet tall. The Lugians are the other, the second of the three really progressive, uh, really technologically minded uh, races. The Lugians are excellent at crafting and designing and engineering. They actually get a racial bonus to engineering just by being a Lugian. They are one of the primary reasons why airships exist, why the railroad exists, you know, things like that. The Lugians, in general, have a very merit-based society. I'll talk about this much more when I get to their actual uh, nation, Osteth, because it'll be more relevant there. But, long story short, in the Lugian society, you only go as far as you both can and want to. Both elements are taken into account. Um, Lugians, like I said, are very progressive. They are a republic. They're actually one of the... They're, they're pretty much the only r true republic. They are closer to a true democracy than they are actually a republic because unlike, say, the United States, where theoretically I could go to my senator and have a vote, in the Lugian Republic, if you go to your senator, or what other title is, I, I wrote down the titles elsewhere, I'll get to it later, and say, you know, I think this about this, not only will they actually make time to listen to you and actually care about your what you're saying, but your comment may actually have some impact on what's going on. It is probably the most democratic uh, of the various organizations. I'm not saying that's because they're good, by the way. Let me make sure. This is not a political thing. This is This is fantasy, okay? No political crap, okay? At least no real-world political crap. This is just my setting. But the Lugians are pretty much pretty close to a full democracy and are run as a representative republic. They uh, are also... Re they, they tend to get along really well with just about everyone except the Burun, and I think you can guess why. I'm not going to say anything else about that. Uh, what's the next race on the list? Lycanthropes. Okay, Lycanthrope, for those of you who do not know what that means, is effectively a werewolf, except the thing is, 
they are not just wolves. I actually had a list. In fact, actually, hang on, let me just pull up my list here really quick. Races. Oops, not in that one. Hey, give me just a second, give me just a second. I can throw, oops. The types of wares you can be, in addition to werewolf, if I could ever find the entry, here we go, are werewolves, of course, were bears, were boars, tigers, leopards, rats, lions, rams, foxes, jaguars, bats, sharks, panthers, and crocodiles. All of these are common, uh, and all of these are possible. I actually have two, uh, had, I should say, two fox lycanthropes within the party. Now, lycanthropes are hard to discuss without going into other things, but let's just try and do center weekend. As I mentioned earlier, lycanthropes have no clans. Some of them may refer to themselves as I am Blah of House Blah, referring to the Derekost house they serve, but that is different than a clan name. Uh, that is simply saying, I am a part of that house. The reason for that is because any lycanthrope you see out in the rest of the world that is not within the Derekost lands, which is, you know, way over there uh, in the Dyers, is someone who has earned the right to be there. There are actually many more lycanthropes than people realize, but the vast majority of them are behind the scenes in the Derekost Republic dealing with each other, or, or I should say, you know, being servants, being workers. The Derekost themselves basically don't actually do any real work, for all intents and purposes, if you understand where I'm going with this. The t lycanthropes do all of it, but, uh, or at least that, that, that's actually a lie. Uh, the lycanthropes do all the mundane work and a lot of the other work. They are f a strange sort of slave race, and I say that because they're actually constructed. Uh, lycanthropes are not born or cursed or anything like that. They were built. And they are built by a house to serve them. Now, there is a very strong social and cultural contract here. In other words, the house promises to take care of the lycanthrope who promises to take care of the house. You understand where I'm going with this? So the Derekost provide you know, for the needs and wants of the lycanthrope, and the lycanthrope provides for the needs and wants of the Derekost. You understand where I'm going with this, right? It is a symbiotic relationship, um, not a true master-servant relationship. That is one of the reasons why so many lycanthropes will say, I am of House Vasmora, for example, to use a specific example, because they consider it an honor and a privilege to be considered a part of that house. It is not their masters. I mean, obviously they are their masters, but that's not what anybody really thinks of it unless the chips are down. You follow me? Now, obviously, sometimes the chips are down. Sometimes the house will say, okay, look, uh, you know, lycanthrope A, Bob, we need you to do this. We're sorry, but just go do this right now. This is important. And most of the time, if they do something like that, it is important. And so the lycanthropes understand, you got it. We got to go do this. Done. Now, as I mentioned, lycanthropes are crafted. They are effectively sentient golems. Let me make this clear. They are sentient. They do have souls. I have to mention both of these facts because this is a setting where magic that affects the soul specifically is actually quite common. And so that would be something that everybody would know. And that was one of the questions that was asked pretty early on. Lycanthropes cannot breed. They cannot have children. They cannot age. Let me stress that again. They are unaging. The, the there has been a lycanthrope the online party has encountered who has been alive for almost two and a half centuries because they don't age, they're constructs, you follow? They can eat and they can uh, drink, but most biological functions are not required of them. You understand where I'm going with this? Now, I listed them under the playable section, but there is one huge caveat. If you are playing a lycanthrope, you are playing a lycanthrope that is going to be tied to a house. In other words, you are out in the world on a mission, or missions, or overall goal, on behalf of that house. The major lycanthrope in the party now, Tabron, is on is a agent of House Vasmora. And they do, uh, in fact, actually need to send him a PM late recently because they're about to message him again. He does have to follow their orders. Now, I'm, I don't abuse that, don't mistake me, but that is something that the player has to consider. You do not have the freedom to do whatever you want, generally. If a player makes a very convincing argument, I could say they are a freed lycanthrope. 
Now, I use that term freed almost laughably because most lycanthropes would consider that to be an insult. And in many, uh, I'd say more like 80% of the cases, if a lycanthrope is offered freedom, they will turn it down. A freed lycanthrope is one who is not bonded to any house. They are their own person. Earning that is considered simultaneously the greatest insult and the greatest reward that any lycanthrope can ever earn. And, it's, and it only happens like once every several decades. It is a truly rare exception that you will find a lycanthrope that A, is good enough to earn it, and B, actually accepts it. Um, I think that's everything I need to mention about the lycanthropes, so I guess I'll move on. Uh, drudges. Now, I freely, if you've ever seen a drudge in Asheron's Call, the first one, not the second one, then you know what a drudge looks like. I didn't really change their appearance at all, except try to picture them with actual clothing. The drudges are amusing uh, species. They're very non-judgmental, partially because they themselves were judged for so long as one of the, and I'm doing the quote unquote here, lesser races. But they actually managed to bind, bind themselves together and form an actual society and founded a whole uh, city-state, uh, you know, mini-nation. And the, they, got, they gained a great deal of acceptance within the four nations, which is the, again, quote-unquote, civilized races. And uh, so the drudges recently have really been seeing an upsurge in how you know, well taken and how popular they are amongst the other races. Generally, a drudge will never get grow taller than five feet, but that's a, an exceptionally tall drudge. Most drudges are going to be closer to like four or so. They are uh, very inquisitive. They are very, very good at uh, putting two and two together. I wouldn't even say they're intelligent. They just have that sort of dynamic thought process where, oh, well, that and that, so this. They also tend to have a very uh, loose emphasis on clans. That's actually a new thing. The drudges were actually basically dying out because they had put too much emphasis on clans and the old ways basically hadn't worked until uh, a specific drudge, who I actually gotta look up his name now because I haven't mentioned him like at all, so I... You know me and names, I don't actually remember them that well if I don't reuse them over and over. Uh, what is his name? Seriously. Strong Arm. That's his name. Strong Arm, uh, who, by the way, has no clan name, and I'll get to uh, the obvious whys in a second. Strong Arm basically united the clans, all of the clans of the Drudges, and said, Look, we can't keep doing this. We need to unite. We need to bind. We are stronger. We are better. Blah, 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 blah. And he's the one who led them to found Collier. He's still around. Strong Arm specifically removed his clan name and... Basically, most people don't even know what it ever was at this point, as a symbolic gesture to the clans of the drudges to say, look, I am a drudge, not a drudge of, you know, uh, actually, let's look up some clan names here. I am not a drudge of Prowler. I am not a drudge of Seraph. I am not a drudge of Lurker. I am a drudge. And so I want to bring the drudges together. And he was very successful. He was very charismatic. And the and Collier, which is where the drudges live, has been a huge success and a huge uh, boon to the drudge society. I uh, encourage players to play drudges, but nobody ever has. Sniffle, sniffle. It's one of the few races I really would like players to play, and nobody has ever actually done so. Next, we have the Mosswarts. Now, well, actually, let's go and do Olthoi next. <sighs> Olthoi pretty much look like you're imagining if you've ever seen them in Asheron's Call. Tall, bipedal, bugs, uh, sort of. But, um, you know, external carapace. Terrifying appearance, all things considered. They have these uh, long, ambidextrous... Uh, Multi, uh, their fingers can flex in all directions, not just forward like ours can. They're very, uh, very good uh, with their hands and the ability to manipulate things. And they also have these claws that come out of their back that can come up and forward and have these blades, which are usually sheathed within a sort of a carapace sheath, basically, that can jut out and can hurt like hell. The average Olthoi also stands quite tall, on average about 6 to... Well, I'm sorry, no, 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 on average about 7 to 8 feet. Uh, there is one important caveat. It is known that only three of the broods, a.k.a. clans, of the, of the Olthoi are ever let out of Central, which is their home territory. 
that would be gardener, worker, and soldier. Most people have never even seen uh, an Olthoi of any other brood or clan. Not many people are sure why, and I'm not going to tell you why, because not many people are sure why. Uh, any given brood is always distinctive based on the color of its carapace. It will always be different. And their size will vary as well. A gardener will be smaller than a worker, will be smaller than a soldier. Um, each clan also tends to specialize in one specific type of thing, and basically nothing else, if you understand what I mean. Um, that's kind of a societal thing rather than an actual uh, species thing. But for example, gardeners are merchants. They go out and they run the stalls and they trade and they travel from place to place, and they really tend to enjoy that sort of thing. Workers are people who are interested in information, scouting, uh, knowledge, archivists, archaeologists, uh, that kind of thing, right? And of course, soldiers exist as bodyguards for gardeners and workers. <laughs> Go figure, right? There are other broods. I'm not going to tell you all of them, but there are... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 other broods in addition to those three. And that's all I'm going to say about that. The Olthoi are not evil. Now let me clarify what I mean by this. There has never been an ethel, evil Olthoi in the history of exist in the history of history. Uh, the Olthoi, as a species, do not understand the concept of evil acts, of selfish acts, of causing harm to another for the sake of oneself. That sort of thing is literally an alien thought to them. The concept of conflict and battles, and in many cases war, or I shouldn't even say war. Uh, large-scale conflict, because I'll, I'll get to the war thing in a bit when I get to much later, is the sort of thing that would ter absolutely terrify an Olthoi. In fact, one of the things, uh, my sister who played Kazrenthka and Olthoi, did an excellent job of playing someone who just did not like the idea of violence or blood at all, and tried to distance herself to the point of sheer self-delusion from the very concept. That's kind of where the Olthoi are at. They are very, very uh, interested in the other races. It is actually considered a treat for an Olthoi to meet a member of another race. It doesn't matter who, and it doesn't matter why. Just the idea of social interaction and that kind of con concept with other races is fascinating to them. And often Olthoi will petition for the right to leave Central and go out and actually you know, be, in enjoy the, you know, the rest of the world. Olthoi are very, very quick on their feet ridiculously so. They are the fastest race by far. In fact, what is their move? Hang on. Give me just a moment. Playable races. Their base move speed is 60 feet. Uh, that's really fast, if you don't understand. That basically means they can move 60 feet in 6 seconds. And that's at standard move speed. That's not running. If Okay, so you understand. Uh, that's basically double what a human uh, on average could do. But they also have other things. I'm not going to go into all the details. I spent a lot of time on the Ulthoi. They really, really also uh, enjoy the concept of relationships, and I don't mean romantic ones. You know, friendships, having a professional relationship, having a familial relationship, all that sort of thing is just fascinating to most Ulthoi. And there are some Ulthoi who actually do engage in romantic interactions with other races. Uh, Ulthoi pretty much never are romantic with each other. Oh, by the way... Olthoi also cannot breed. Uh, the only Olthoi that can have children are the broodmothers, and there is only one broodmother per brood, if you understand. The broodmother of, of Worker has been the broodmother of Worker since Worker existed, if you understand what I mean by that. One last thing. Olthoi don't age. I mentioned that uh, lycanthropes and... Uh, Olthoi were basically tied for the oldest living races, and that's because neither of them age at all. An Olthoi who is not killed will theoretically live forever. They are more biological than the lycanthropes, though. They are not constructs. They do actually have to eat. And in fact, uh, one of the things I loved about Kazrenska, I'll talk about this more in detail later uh, in another video, by the way, is that she had this huge thing about cooking, and she was constantly searching for new recipes and new foods and new delicacies to sample because she loved all the different flavors of it, and I really liked that addition to her character. Moving on. I could talk about the Olthoi for quite a while, but suffice it to say, I'm rather pleased with them, and they, they serve a very important piece of the puzzle of the overall setting. 
Oh, one other thing. The Olthoi also have put considerable time, effort, resources, etc. behind maintaining the peace between the four nations for the last century. That's very important. The fairies have too, but I'll get to that more in organizations. And now we get to the, and again, quote-unquote, lesser races. All of these, okay, no, I'm sorry, I'm doing this out of order. My bad, ignore that. Next race is the mites, M-I-T-E-S. Mites are extremely short, uh, you know, average three-foot height, uh, fox creatures, basically. If you can imagine an anthropomorphic uh, fox, you've basically got it. There is one thing about them that is not normal. Uh, it's ironic, because I just mentioned the Olthoi. They have very long fingers that have uh, multiple knuckles each, and they can u they are really, really uh, skilled at using those fingers uh, in order to, like, for example, do delicate work. Uh, they, don't, they don't have shaking hands like, you know, everybody does. They can just... Oh, you know, yep, let me do this and this and this, and you, and, and you could just see them, you know, like twisting their own fingers over themselves at, at, at the th third knuckle there as they're working on something. And some people say it's kind of unnerving, but they're very good craftsmen as a resultant. Mites are the third of the three races I've been mentioning. Gnolls, Lugians, Mites. Uh, mites are stupidly smart. That's basically their only racial bonus is Int. They, ha they are ridiculously smart. There is an Arc Mage Weaver who is, who is a Mite, who is a teenager. Please try to understand the full significance of that fact. Uh, I've only introduced one. He, he is smart even for a mite, but n the people who actually pay attention to my setting when they learned that were like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Why? Because he's a mite. Because that's what they are known for. They are intelligent. They are really, really good with magic and really, really good with technology. Now, I mentioned earlier mites have no clan names. That is because a mite is basically free of prejudice. Now, do try to understand that when I say the word prejudice, I don't mean, you know, I hate all people of a certain skin color. Now, that is obviously a prejudice, but the word prejudice, as I am using it in this sentence to define the mites, is they don't prejudge anything. The fact that you are an ogre means nothing to them. They look at that ogre that you are, and they say, that is you. They don't care about your clan. They don't care about what company you're from. They don't care about what flag you carry. They don't care what bandit group you're from. They don't care who your parents are. The only thing that matters to a mite is the individual. So that is why they don't really care about family ties, and they don't really care about clan names. And that's why the mites have never had clan names. It also means the mites simultaneously get along really well and really poorly with everyone, if you know what I mean. You know, it basically depends on the other individual. But a mite will basically be very amiable and, and never basically judge you on anything. They tend to be very hyper. They tend to be very energetic. But that's a result of the fact that their brain is literally always going. If you see someone who is that smart, you're not going to be able to just tie them down. You know what I mean? I mean, you could, but then they're just going to explode. And then, you know, sugar is going to go everywhere. The mites... Uh, one last thing here. The mites... Uh, I was going to mention these last for specific reasons, but the mites are the ones who manage to work out most of the ancient technology. Now, I can tell you, the viewer, that I am referring to psionic technology, because you, the viewer, are aware of what the scions are. But most of the setting does not know what the word scion means. They refer to them as the ancients, or the precursors, or whatever. They have no specific term for them. But there are ruins, and there are pieces of airships that have been found... Uh, throughout the world throughout the last three centuries, three and a half centuries. The mites are the ones who have studied those and fa figured out how to get them working, sort of. They are the closest ones who have ever figured out how to work psionic technology. And pretty much all of the innovations of the recent years, uh, hell, in, in general, across the setting, has been the result of the mites working together with the Lugians, who are the excellent craftsmen, and the gnolls, who are also very intelligent and happen to be just crazy enough to try things that they probably shouldn't. If you get me. Oh, all right, now we're going to talk about the quote-unquote lesser races. And then we're going to discuss two races last, and then we'll move on. Sorry, there's a lot of races in my, in my game. What do you want? First race is the Mosswarts. Now, these are basically amphibious-looking creatures that are... Uh, I, I don't want to describe them vi visually too much, because what they are in my mind has changed several times, and I'm not really sure where I want it to land. But suffice it to say, amphibious humanoids is probably a good description. 
the moss warts overall are pretty much hated by most other people. Most other races, I should say. The moss warts had such a bad... To, uh, such a bad reputation with everyone else that they are pretty much the reason Stonehold exists. I'll talk about that later, obviously, when we get to nations, but it is the Moswarts who founded Stonehold, who began that particular uh, mentality. They are automatically uh, very, very, very skilled in weaving, which I will also discuss later. Which means, uh, in case you're paying attention, they are innately magically connected. Uh, or I should say, innately connected to magic itself. Uh, not necessarily the elements, but definitely magic. Mosswarts also have a great deal of wisdom, patience, that kind of a thing. They tend to look, take the long view. Now, you may be wondering, based on all these things, why are they so hated by the other races? Well, the Mosswarts uh, actually enjoy certain smells and flavors as far as food and, you know, just aesthetics that are literally disgusting to other races and in some cases vomit-inducing. You know, it might actually hit your gag reflex. So any given mosswort you encounter may or may not smell so horrible that you might have to actually hold your nose while you're around them. And that is basically the primary problem there. It is also worth noting that the mosswarts have become very stuck in their in that preference. I mean, obviously they could change if they wanted to, if they cared to. And individuals do. There are individual mosswarts who say, you know, uh, screw this, or don't care for the, that particular odorific life, and will change in order to be accepted in the rest of society. But, and, you know, in the civilized society. But the m general point here is that most mosswarts, especially uh, those who really are el uh, loyal to their clans, refuse to. They say, okay, no. We are not going to change who we are. We are not going to change what we are. We're the Mosswarts, damn it. And so they, as, as they've been hated by the other races, they have fed off of that in order to create basically a cultural identity of being hated by the civilized races. You follow where I'm going with this? Interestingly enough, I mentioned there is wisdom and intellect. They are also quite intelligent. In fact, overall... The only race that could really have a claim as far as a racial feature of being smarter than a Mosswart is a mite. Think about that for a bit. Let's move on to the kobolds. Now, kobolds in my setting are kind of an amalgamation of several kobolds from several settings. They are short, uh, vaguely lizard-like creatures. Uh, again, about the same height as uh, the mites, you know, three to four feet. They are very ambidextrous. They can see in the dark. Um, they have a very swarm mentality. And that's one of the reasons why clans ha are very, 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 very important to the kobolds. Because an individual kobold will generally consider himself to be nothing. Uh, actually, ant would be a better way to put this. Consider them like ants. One ant. What does one ant matter? Well, what do a million ants matter? And if you go after a kobold, you'd better better make sure you actually finish them off, because they will probably be back with a dozen or so of their friends. Uh, because they will... And, and their mentality... It's, I almost call it like the geth in Mass Effect, except obviously the geth literally grow more intelligent when there are more of them. But the mentality, the cultural uh, mindset of a kobold is so set in this mindset that one is nothing but many is strong that generally you will never even find an individual kobold. You will find kobolds. Because one kobold will not consider themselves relevant unless there are other kobolds around with them. You follow me? It is also worth noting that this does not necessarily mean other kobolds. Uh, obviously, prim primarily it does, but for example, in an adventuring party, if you had a kobold in a party, that kobold would never venture out on his or her own because he or she is only relevant, only matters, as long as he or she is with the group. You follow? As long as she's part of the, uh, the the organization, or he is, or whatever. You get the point. Uh, that's the kobolds in a nutshell. The goblins. Now, the goblins... Uh, I actually don't have a lot to say about the goblins, but believe it or not, that's actually because of the, the setting doesn't know much about goblins. I know more about goblins than I'm about to tell you. They are generally known to be very good at mer mercantile type things. Uh, you know, merchant merchandising and the like. And they are also, they also have a really 
interesting um, mindset. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of how to describe this. Basically, let's just say that goblins are better with their words than any other race. A goblin knows how to talk to you. If he if you talk to a goblin for five or six minutes, he will probably figure out exactly how to phrase his words, his posture, his tone, his movement of his hands, you know, anything like that, in a way that will connect with you. And you will start to agree with whatever that goblin is, is saying, generally, of course. This is general, generalizing. Because they're speaking your language, if you understand my meaning. Goblins are really, really good at interacting with with anybody, other races, other goblins, doesn't matter. It is probably no surprise to anybody that even though the Mosswarts are why Stonehold exists, the goblins run the place. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Goblins are, uh, visually speaking, uh, basically goblins from WoW. I know that's kind of copy-pasting, but I like the aesthetic of the visual appeal there. So short, big ears, kind of like uh, Ferengi, I guess, <laughs> except green. So then we've got the Knolls. For those of you who don't, are not familiar with D&D, that is G-N-O-L-L. Gnolls are these tall, uh, feral, almost feline-looking creatures. They're generally quite large. Uh, they can also grow to be even quite larger. Uh, Iron Paw, I mentioned him much earlier in the clans thing, is, oh, I think I decided he was over 10 feet tall. He was a big guy. And when I say 10 feet tall, keep in mind that that's at the height where his shoulders are, basically, because his head goes forward from his shoulders because of the way he's sloped forward. He was a big guy. Uh, visually speaking, if you can picture the char from Guild Wars 2, that is very similar. That's the closest thing I've ever seen uh, in artwork to what I mentally picture as the gnolls. They are really interesting in the fact that gnolls tend to be extremists. Any given gnoll may be very, very into fighting. They may be very, very into money. They may be very, very into killing. They may be very, very into farming. They may be very, very into fishing. Uh, you get the general point here, right? A knoll who likes something will generally throw their all into it, and they tend to also have a great deal of loyalty. Now, what that loyalty is to obviously varies significantly, but, you know, the loyalty itself is, a, is basically a racial, cultural trait, for all intents and purposes. Obviously not... Obviously, I am, as always, generalizing... But you get the point. You know, if a knoll has given his or her loyalty to someone, it is probably for keeps unless they are very severely injured. And as a consequence, if a knoll has that loyalty broken, they're going to take it much harder than another race would. Um, knolls are also pretty much built for combat, and I'm just going to... I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about the uh, Sklavi. And that's basically all there is I have to say about them. Knolls are awesome. Um... Next race is the Centaur. Uh, this is basically the last race. I've got two more to cover in brief after the Centaur. Centaurs... I mentioned earlier that the Burun are very traditionalist to the point of apathetic, to the point of stagnation. The Centaurs are all that taken to a violent extreme. Centaurs, as a whole, basically hate the idea of progression to the as a philosophical choice. They hate... What they what they call the the fake magic that other people use, you know, magery, spells, uh, weaving, etc. They hate the whole technological advancements in in weaving and magic that the world uh, advances itself in. Most of the time, if you see a centaur group that is attacking a, a caravan or whatever, they are not doing so to steal like a bandit grip would. They are there to kill or to destroy because they hate the idea of the fact that you're using technology or magic. They hate you. Centaurs have an extremely bad reputation as a result of this. Now, if you've been paying attention so far, you know that I am speaking in generalizations, and I'm also talking about this perspective from the perspective of an average player, which is probably from one of the four nations, a.k.a. the quote-unquote civilized races. I just thought I'd point that out. Um, most of the centaur that people see do not do anything to help with that uh, particular mindset. To date, I've only had one player ever ask to play a centaur, and she came up with an excellent uh, reason for her being playable, basically, and did uh, did a very excellent job of it, all things considered. Now, I mentioned there were two other races. I'm only going to mention both in brief, because both of them deserve to be uh, talked about later. But I wanted to mention that there are the Derekost, which actually refers to three races, and 
the Tumorok. The Derekost consist of... Uh, oh shoot, what did I actually name them? I'm sorry, give me just a moment. You know me in names. I'm just terrible. Whoops. The Republic of Derekost. So, well, first and foremost, as you know, the Derekost have built uh, lycanthropes and have built lycanthropes. That by itself tells you most of what you need to know about them as a group. The fact that they can create sentient golems that live forever uh, probably says something about them. They have three races. Ah, oh, there we go. I'm sorry, I was actually... Uh, okay. There's a lot of reasons behind this. I will not be telling you any of them. There are the rotting, the revenants, and the pures. A rotting looks like a completely typical undead kind of person, right? You know, their organs aren't um, uh, dropping out or anything, but they are decaying. They usually will have specific clothing designed to keep their body together, that kind of a thing. And they have a bit of difficulty getting around. Rotting are usually treated as something to be pitied rather than uh, lamented, if you understand. Obviously, rotting are kept within Derekost lands. You will basically never see a rotting leave the Derekost territory and go out for the rest of the world. Rotting, however, basically, there's nothing wrong with their minds, is the best way I could put that. And they tend to have a great deal of patience with other races when they do encounter them, because they know just how horrible they look. They do not smell. I just felt like pointing that out, because it's kind of relevant. Revenants are a step up from that. They look like basically someone who has been desiccated slightly. You know, dry skin, cracks along it, you know... Uh, probably no eyes, that kind of a thing. But otherwise, they're they are pretty much normal looking. Der uh, Revenants will be pretty much 99% of the Derekost you will ever encounter will be a Revenant. They tend, they're actually the most common of all the Derekostians, and they have a great deal of political power within the Republic, and they tend to basically run the economy of the Republic as well in the port town of Weiju which is where uh, most of the interactions with the Duracost and the other races happen these days. I'll get to that later, like I said. Finally, we have the Pures. A Pure looks like a completely ordinary human who happens to be several feet taller. That's all I'm going to say, because that's all anybody knows about them. Now, let's go ahead and segue into major cities. Oh, hang on. Let's go ahead and take a, a timestamp here. My goodness. Uh, no, I have to add seconds, too, don't I? Whoops. <laughs> because I'm into the hour already. Wow, this is going to be a long video. I'm, like, nowhere in my list. Um, the major cities. Okay, there are several major cities. I'm not actually going to go down the list and name all of them. You know, for example, Holtberg. Uh, lots of you have seen, saw my Holtberg video. Uh, what I am going to do is discuss what a major city is. There are several facets about the major cities that are all shared. One of them is the hub. I, the hub refers to a system or, that is a network of teleportation devices. There is one in every major city, and uh, they are operated by the mites. There is a whole organization of mites who specifically reverse engineered the ability to use the hub. Excuse me, they're the only ones who have ever figured out how to use the hub. They can't actually, they have no idea how to make them, or to repair them, for example, but they've never had to, because no hub has ever actually been damaged. The hub is basically instantaneous transportation to any other hub point. Now, the mites have organized this quite a bit, as you might imagine for a race with that level, and kind of intelligence and mindset. But for example, if you have to have, if you're in Alluvia, if you're in Holtberg, you have to have a visa to travel to any city that is not in Holtberg. Now, visas can be obtained, you know, legitimately and, and, and otherwise. But, long story short, if you try to p pass a fake visa across a mite, there's a really good chance they're going to catch you in the act, and uh, the penalty will depend completely on the individual mite. There is a small fee for using the hub, but it's basically trivial. You can also purchase, like, you know, I want free access to all Alluvian transports for this month for a set fee if you're going to be traveling a lot. There are many people who do this. 
hub travel has basically completely revolutionized uh, most of the economy of the planet, or, you know, the continent, because the instantaneous travel thing basically does not have an upper limit on size of what can be transported. So there are people who will take entire caravans through, if you understand where I'm going with this, and they have a specific... Uh, setups you know for, there's individuals who just want to go through the hub there's people who want to go through with goods and then there's people who want to go through with large goods and so forth and so on it's all quite organized so every major city has a hub now when i say that keep in mind that there are some cities that have been founded afterwards like collier for example uh these cities obviously do not have hubs uh because you know duh and in case I didn't get the point across correctly, the hubs were our psionic technology. Not that anybody knows that, of course. But they were here when the major cities were here, which is the third point. I'll get to that last, obviously. The second point is just the walls. Every major city has these walls that are made of relatively appropriate material for the area that surround them. And they're usually quite tall. How tall they are depends on how large the city is. For example, Holtberg's walls are hundreds upon hundreds of feet high. They're also quite wide and thick. These walls have attempted, people have attempted to study these walls for centuries and failed. They are essentially morphic. That is to say, any given wall, it looks quite solid. But if you were to try to, for example, cast at it, your spell would go through it and then be absorbed within it rather than hitting it and bouncing off. The energy is not deflected, it is eaten. And the same goes for, for example, trying to use scan on it or magical uh, means of... of detecting it, that kind of thing. It, same basic problem. The other interesting thing about the walls is they can't be tricked into... Okay, I, I'm going to get ahead of myself. They expand based on the needs of the city. Back, you know, at the year zero, 350 years ago, basically, the walls were obviously much, much smaller, both in terms of height and in terms of how large the city limit was, because the wall was surrounded the entire city. As time has gone on, the walls have expanded outwards and upwards in order to accommodate the city. Some people have tried to trick the walls by, you know, okay, well, let's go build a whole bunch of residences in the area that it just expanded into, and then it'll be, get even bigger. It doesn't work that way. The wall will know, somehow, how big the city actually needs to be for its actual residence, and it will grow accordingly. People, Most people just kind of have given up trying to understand the thing. There are obviously still people who study the walls, but for the most part, most people just kind of accept that they're there and move on. And of course, the final thing, which I've already alluded at, is the fact that all the major cities were there at year zero. They already existed, the walls already existed, the hub already existed. All the major cities have been around for at least 350 years, because they were already founded when year zero happened. Alright, that was a little quicker than my racial section, my goodness. Uh, 45. Let's talk about the technology of our setting. Now, when I say technology, when I say technology, what I kind of mean is magic, uh, for all intents and purposes. Pardon me a moment. Uh, there are... The whole setting is extremely magic-heavy. Uh, think Eberron, except possibly more so, actually. Basically, everything that we have as modern conveniences in the real world, or similar-like things, has been replaced by something of a magical nature within this setting. That also leads me into my next subject, weaving. Now, anybody who's been following this vlog know, uh, knows what weaving is, at least to some extent. To summarize excessively, weaving is magically creating an item. Even mundane groups that make just, you know, beds, windows, you know, chairs, generally will use weaving to do so. Weaving accounts for at least 80% of the production of all goods in the entire world, probably higher than 80% actually. Even when you have something that is crafted mundanely first, like a sword or a chair or a, a bed, can't think of any other good examples right now, someone will, it will usually be handed off then to a weaver who will then weave magic into it in some fashion or another. Thus, magic items are prolific to the point of ridiculous. And there's some economic problems with that as well, but that is by design, believe it or not. I actually have been very specific with the economic model of my setting, but I'm not going to bore you with that right now. So suffice it to say, that's weaving, and like I said, very magic-heavy. There is a thing, there is technology, regardless of weaving. There is engineering. Uh, the Lugians have pretty much been the big pushers of that. You know, the, the Lugians tend to engineer, and the Mites and the Gnolls tend to 
weave, and the combination tends to make whatever the result is. But for example, there is Magitech. Now yes, I borrowed that, that term wholesale from FF6, and no, I don't care. Magitech is literally technology that is magical, or magical technology would actually be a better way to put that. In other words, it is neither magic nor technology. It is actually a true fusion of both. Magitech is incredibly complicated and generally the most difficult thing to do. If you have a master engineer and a master weaver, they still would have to, would have incredible difficulty working together to make a piece of Magitech. Overall, I've actually only designed two specific Magitech items within my setting. Uh, there's the general impression that there is other Magitech, but you get the general impression is that you know it is incredibly rare and is incredibly hard to do. Those two things are airships. Well, okay, airships, magicite ships, and which are basically the same thing, just kind of different. And mag lancers. Let's talk about mag lancers first, because that's the easiest. Mag lancers are the equivalent of guns in my setting. They are magitech guns. Once you have a mag lancer, you basically don't need to ever get another one. Uh, getting a different mag lancer will not improve its quality at all. What will change, what it can do, is its ammunition, which is it can vary so much I don't even know where to begin. I cannot even begin to summarize. Basically anything can be the is is what kind of ammunition you can get for a mag lancer. Now, mag lancers are ridiculously difficult to use, make, and yeah, I guess that's it, use and make. And so they're very, very expensive and the training for them is also very, very expensive. And the ammunition for them, as varied as it is, is very, very expensive as you might imagine. The ammunition itself, by the way, is also Magitech. It is not uh, pure weaving, so it's another thing where you basically have to have someone who knows how to make ammunition for that. So there's quite a bit... Of, it, basically, if you have a Mag Lancer and can actually use it and have ammunition for it, you are one of the, like, point oh 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 one percentile, you know what I mean? It is pretty much the, the sign of elite status, other than the next thing I'm about to talk about. Now, Magicite ships, uh, I'll talk about the difference between the ships much, much later. Suffice it to say, Magicite ships are exactly what they sound like. Ships powered by magic. Uh, they're not actually fully... They're, they're less Magitech than the next thing I'm about to mention. The only Magitech part about them is the engine. The rest of the ship is just, you know, a ship. It, it's an ordinary ship. Usually constructed of metal hulls, because it's easier to do it that way. Um, but for all intents and purposes, if you if you replaced steam with Magitech, you would basically get the general uh, gist here. And I don't have anything else to say about that except the fact that Magitech ships are much, much more expensive to purchase, but much, much cheaper to maintain. And so, in general, you will see Magitech ships being used by uh, large corporations for mass transit and cargo. You generally won't see that for, like, the average individual. They'll just get a sailing ship, but moving along. Final thing, finally, finally, but building up to this, airships. Airships, uh, if you've ever played Homeworld 2, you know what the airships in my setting look like. Yes, really. Um, I, w I actually sat down one day and started sketching out several of the airships, and I realized that I, was, I, I might as well just start linking Homeworld 2 pictures to the players, which is what I started doing, because that is basically what I was sketching out. They are very angular, very blocky, they tend to be uh, thin and long, they don't look anything like airships, you know, from, say, the Final Fantasy series, uh, for example. And there is very little aesthetic sense to them. They are basically function personified. Airships are pretty much... There are not many airships in the setting. In fact, I actually have a list of every airship that exists in the entire setting. Yes, all of them. I uh, th Now, that list is not particularly large. That is how few airships there are. Uh, actually, I guess I'm lying. I'm sorry. I'll take that back. I have a list of every airship in the setting, with some exceptions. I'll get to that in a minute. But I do have a list of 100% of the military airships in the setting, because really, you do need to divide airships into military airships and civilian airships. Military airships are insane. They have scanning technology, uh, scanning Magitech, sorry, that can tell you how much air someone is breathing several miles away. They have the ability to move silently, without the giant thrum, thrum, thrum. Obviously, that takes more energy. They have the ability to turn, you know, to basically run silently from a visual perspective. They can't actually cloak. But an airship, who, which is silent in, in terms of uh, 
in, in terms of audio, and has all of its lights off and is moving in stealth mode at night, is basically invisible. An airship has mundane, magitech, and magical weaponry on it, all of which is capable of decimating basically anything, uh, for the most part. We're talking battleship-level destruction here. And again, mundane, you know, technological, magitech, and magical. They've got it all. They also have uh, armor plating. They have magical shielding, uh, you know, force field type thing. And many, 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 many other features I could go on about for quite a while. They are powered by gigantic uh, magitech engines, which hu take ridiculous amounts of magicite that has specifically been utilized uh, for that engine, that specific engine, mind you, not just any airship engine, in order to uh, power it. However, once a magicite core has been put in, any given airship can stay in the air, uh, not counting you know, general supplies like food and, and water and stuff like that, pretty much until the fuel runs out, which will take several years. And the average fuel life for a military airship is three years, which is pretty damn good, all things considered. It is worth noting that the full military might of airships has only been tested twice, and nobody knows the f exact results of it. They only know the consequences of it. I will discuss that later. The, uh, I skipped over the Tomb Rock. <laughs> Whatever, that's better mentioned later. The civilian airships are obviously much, 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 much less powerful generally aren't even allowed to have weapons on them, unless it's just purely mundane technological weapons. However, uh, they are still ridiculously expensive and ridiculously difficult to craft. There is an entire corporation, Praxis and, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Zelios Drive Yards, which I'll mention later, whose entire existence is the airship provider. And when I say the, I mean the only one. They're the only ones who produce civilian airships in the entire setting. If you want a civilian a airship that is not military, you need to go to them. And I think that's it for technology, so let's go ahead and segue into organizations. Now let's talk about the Order. The Order of Summoners, as it's most likely called. I've talked about this in brief before. The Order of Summoners is an organization that has been around since, since before Year Zero. They're basically the only one, the only organization that's been around that long. Um, they're the reason we have a history. They're the ones who started keeping, you know, record of, you know, okay, we're going to establish a calendar, stuff like that. They're the reason that uh, much of cultural literature and art and music and that kind of thing has been preserved because their entire second wing, the, the, the order is divided into three wings. The first wing d deals entirely with green magic, summoning, and the elements. The second wing deals entirely with preservation of history, culture, knowledge, etc. The third wing is the quote-unquote military wing. And I have to say quote-unquote because it's calling it military is almost uh, amusing. It's more like the special operations. It is not an army. It is a group of elite, if you understand what I mean. And it's very much, much smaller than the other two wings, obviously. Um, the Order, like I said, it's been around since forever. The Order receives regular donations from everything. The Order also, uh, from everyone, I mean. So they have a ludicrous amount of money at their disposal, basically at will. The Order also uses that money quite regularly on uh, relief missions or aid or medical supplies, that kind of thing. The Order has made it a, a mission of itself, uh, especially the Second Wing for centuries, literally, to provide aid wherever it's needed. Most of the reason why the attack of 34 years ago, or whatever it is, that I'll talk about much later when I get to history, wasn't worse, was because of the order. In general, they have a 99.99 repeating percent uh, positive PR with everybody. I'd like to take an aside to just mention something as a GM, as a storyteller. The more I emphasize all the good that the Order does, and all the, uh, how well-liked they are, and all that, all the things they do, the more the players in my online campaign don't trust them and hate them. And I find that hilarious, because I'm almost doing it on purpose now. I will mention, you know, I will actually go out of my way to mention some nice thing that the Order did, and they'll be like, oh, great, the Order did that. I wonder what their secret, hor hor horrible, ulterior motive was. Now, of course, they have their own reasons for just thinking that, I'm sure. 
I just thought I'd mention it because I think it's funny. Uh, other organizations, major organizations, uh, let's go ahead and just kind of zip through these because none of these are hugely important, but I felt they were relevant enough to at least mention. I'm actually going to pull up my notes specifically and just go down the list. Here we go. The Country Writer is an organization that uh, several people got together uh, several decades ago and basically purchased the right to post, that is to say mail, from all the different four nations and organized it all into one organization. They got a huge long-term contract with the Mites. And basically, at this point in time, Country Rider has an outpost in almost every city in the entire continent. And you can literally send a package from one end of the continent to the other, and at worst, it will take a couple of days to get there. If you want it to get there today, it will cost a little more. If you want to get there within the hour, it will cost a little more, but you could probably manage that because that's what Country Rider does. Country Rider also uses ATS, which I'll get to in a minute. Zelios Drive Mar Yards, I also already mentioned that. Actually, their biggest industry, uh, obviously they do airships. They're the only source of civilian airships, so any or organization that is big enough to have airships uses Zelios Drive Yards. By the way, there's another thing about the order I'll talk about later because it's more relevant later. Just thought I'd mention that. I was just reminded of it. Um... They primarily make most of their money off of sailing ships and magicite ships. Zelios Drive Yards is basically where you go to if you want to get some kind of ship. If you want to sail the seas, or if you want to sail the skies, you go to them. Provincial Trading Company, the PTC. Now, the party has encountered them several times. The PTC is a household name. It makes just about everything. Food, drink, utensils, clothing, weapon, armor, ration supplies immensely common, no matter which organization, or I'm sorry, no matter which nation you're in, even if you're in Stonehold. However, both the Olthoi and the Derekost flatly refuse to trade with the PTC. I just thought I'd mention that. The PTC has an interesting reputation. I would call it similar to Walmart here in the States, a.k.a. Everybody still buys their stuff, but they're like, ah, oh, Walmart, the big, horrible corporation of doom, and right? However, part of that is because of the IGA, which I will discuss next. The Internal and General Affairs Company is actually a mercenary corporation that uh, works, is, is, is entirely founded and run by the PTC. The IGA is a group of thugs. Anyone who can beat in someone's head or break down a door is welcome in the IGA, and both activities are very common on their payroll. They're not actually technically a mercenary company. They're basically just a branch of the PTC, but they can tend to be lumped in with them. They do not... They have a ridiculously bad reputation. They do not conduct themselves well, even when on dirty jobs. When not on dirty jobs, I should say. But the problem here is the IGA is extremely well-funded, and they really have no problem sending 20 guys after one problem. And... Let's just say that turn turnover due to death is actually quite common in the IGA. The interesting thing about the IGA is because their recruitment policies are basically can you carry a weapon, or I'm sorry, the recruitment uh, requirements are basically can you carry a weapon, they have no shortages of recruits. And the IGA has actually been getting bigger as of late. Uh, and I'll just let that percolate in the back of your mind when you start hearing me talk about what's been happening lately within the setting. The Praxis Industrial Company does large-scale or heavy difficulty uh, weaving things. Praxis employs archmages, truly powerful, truly skilled weavers who can weave the really difficult things. I mentioned, I mentioned to my players, uh, forgive me for not giving you a full detailed list, the kind of things that are difficult to weave, you know, the kind of things that are super difficult to weave. Generally, if someone who, who is not trying to weave themselves needs something of that thing, they will go to Praxis, and it will cost. But they will give you a quality good as a result. They don't have a lot of uh, outposts, but they don't really need them, because most people will seek out Praxis if they need something that specific. ATS, Archon Transport Systems. I mentioned these earlier. ATS has a huge amount of caravans, magicite ships, regular ships. They even have airships, which they use to do transit and transport. They are a transport and shipping concern. They do a hu They have some several contracts with Country Rider. I mentioned that earlier, and they do at least sixty to eighty percent of all commercial large-scale transport for the entire continent, for every corporation, for every nation. 
a ludicrous amount of money flows through ATS on a daily basis, and for all intents and purposes, the ATS is probably the single most wealthy and fin and politically powerful of all of these groups, with the exception of the Order, which could basically be considered its own nation. The ATS also founded their own uh, mercenary company, which is an actual mercenary company, it just only works for them, called the Blue Sentinels. It has been asked, did I name them after the guys in Mass Effect? To which the answer is no, that is literally pure coincidence. Um, they are very well equipped and very well funded. They see almost constant action. You basically do not have downtime in the Blue Sentinels. They uh, have a similar... In, uh, okay, they are much, much, much more picky about who they will allow to join, and they will also provide some training, but they require you to have certain knowledge just to be able to be a part of the Sentinels than, say, the IGA, or in indeed just about any other uh, mercenary company. The Blue Sentinels also basically are seen as an excellent way to start a good career, e if either as a mercenary or as a military, because even if you're just starting out, if you join the Blue Sentinels, by the time you finish your term, if you are alive, you will be very good at what you do, because, you, like I said, they see virtually constant action. Uh, then we have the Dragonkin Sworn. This is another mercenary company consisting entirely of Dragoons. They hold to an old code uh, that they, they're they not even sure who wrote. It was found uh, in, by the founder of the Order, whose name I actually don't remember off the top of my head here. It is a, it's a whole code about honor and duty and an attempt at conduct. It creates a very strange situation with the with the Dragonkin Sworn because they are both loved and hated by the rest of the world. They refuse a lot of jobs that would conflict with their code and always try to conduct themselves honorably on any missions they do accept. They're also really expensive, so some people just absolutely cannot stand them and hate the fact that they can't employ them. But those who can and do find them to be absolutely amazing. The Bloodied Flock is a strangeness. It was formed as part of a treaty signed by the major nations for, uh, over a century ago, which I will talk about when I get to history. The Bloodied Flock is legitimized assassination. It is actually really complicated. I outlined the entire details for one of my members who want, one of my players who wanted to be a member of the Bloodied Flock. You will forgive me for not going over the entire lengthy d detail of how it works. Suffice it to say, they have certain ranks from nine, which is the base. You know, you just start out to zero, which is the absolute elite ranks of the Bloodied Flock. The higher your rank, the more difficult missions you will receive. The more they will pay. You have a writ, which is specially signed and specially designed, and is really very difficult to counterfeit, although it is possible, that basically you, sh you, specific you specifically go out of way to kill your target, or not kill them, because there are exceptions. Like I said, I don't want to go all the way into it. And once you kill your target, you specifically go to, you know, whomever, the local guard or the town or whatever, and specifically say, here, I just killed this individual, here is my writ. You know, very legitimate, very above board, very official. And they'll be like, all right, go ahead, and then you go back and get your pay from the flock. The flock has a ridiculous level of complexity involved in its overall process, and they do not come cheap. And that's really all I'm going to say about that. Final organization I'm going to discuss is known as the Undermarket. I'm going to go ahead and tell you more about the Undermarket than it actually exists within my default setting document. Suffice it to say... The Undermarket is exactly what it sounds like. Which is funny, because I actually didn't intend that initially, believe it or not. The term just stuck with me when I first was working all this out. And I loved the, 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 the way it sounded on my lips, basically. You know, I love Undermarket. It just sounded, it really flowed for me. But as I was working on it, I realized how I wanted to put it. Basically, the Undermarket is the Undermarket. It is the market that exists to support the market. It is the reason the economy manages to run as smoothly as it does. Now, the undermarket is obviously the illegal market. It is all of the things that are illegal or need to be smuggled. It is worth noting that just because something is illegal does not make it bad or wrong or anything like that. It is also worth noting that many things crafted, sold, traded, etc. by the undermarket are simply things that people want to avoid taxes on. Because tariffs are a huge source of income for cor corporations, I'm sorry, for, for nations, for nations. So, 
the undermarket is used by basically everyone. And as a resultant, it's very integral to the overall economy of the entire planet. And, and just about everyone knows about it. And just about everyone tolerates it because just about everyone knows that, just like I told you. Now, the nations of my world, of my continent. Let's start with the four nations. I'm going to kind of burn through these because the level of complexity that goes into the nations is actually extensive. So I'm just going to give you kind of bite-sized chunks here, okay? The four nations. The Kingdom of Alluvia is essentially a nobility-based uh, royalty system, right? A uh, monarchy. The, queen, the High Queen, who is a Lord Elf, by the way, High Queen Elissa, sits on the throne and ultimately has final say, but the politics of the court and the counts and the the various individuals who work with that basically result in the fact that no one individual is actually in charge and there's a lot of conflicting interests in what what the kingdom as a whole should do so alluvia doesn't really function as a single unit per se alluvia is basically the melting pot it also has a very specific type of market which i don't have the proper terms to describe right now forgive me but it is basically best described as constantly needing new resources constantly needing new markets constantly needing new customers Again, that was designed on purpose. Um, let's pull this up here really quick, just for the heck of it. Because I actually don't bother to do this. The Alluvian military is arguably the strongest in the world. Uh, very, uh, not strong in the sense of they're all elite. They just have lots and lots of military. Their military is huge because their military budget is huge. That's politics at work again, by the way. And they also have the largest airship fleet. That would also be politics at work, by the way. Um... The Queen is obviously in charge. There are the Earls, of which there are only a few, and the Viscounts, or Viscounts if you prefer, uh, who manage various levels of things underneath the, the Earl and then the Queen. Underneath them, that's all the, that's all the upper leadership. Uh, and there are only, a f uh, I think there's three Earls and there's something like 12 Viscounts. There are, there is one Lord or Lady f per each province. The kingdom is divided up into provinces, uh, one based around each major city within it. And the lord runs that province. Underneath them are the marquesses. Do note that I do specifically say marquess, not marquis. Marquis, there's a difference. The marquesses are in charge of things on a grouped level, is the best way I would put that. And then underneath them are the baronets, who are basically the equivalent of mayors, and so forth and so on in lower levels of bureaucracy. I won't bore you with those. A couple of things about Alluvia. I mentioned Alluvia is the melting pot. I really do mean that pretty literally, especially as a kingdom sense. Really defining Alluvia is almost impossible. It's everything, everywhere, everyone. It, the only thing you could really point to it and say, that's Alluvia, is the fact that they have the biggest, largest, I should say, military. Speaking of which, <laughs> the, uh, well, no, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. The other thing I wanted to mention is that Alluvia also has several uh, vassal states, two of them, uh, that are really relevant here, which I will go ahead and mention now rather than continue on with the other four nations. Eastham and Arwick. Now, I mentioned Arwick earlier. Arwick is basically the, the, the city-state of the fairies. It's only one city and its surrounding area, but it is basically where, what the fairies claim as their home, quote-unquote, but they are ultimately answerable to the uh, Alluvian kingdom. In fact, actually, they're specifically answerable to the lord of Glendon Wood, uh, who I actually have named. I just don't feel like looking it up right now. I do have names for all these individuals, by the way. I have notes upon notes upon notes, but I'm not good with names in general, and that's why I have notes upon notes upon notes here. I'm just going to look it up just to prove it. Lord Farin Silent Blade of Silent Blade, who is an elf male. Thank you. Moving on. So, Arwick isn't really a organization per se. However, the Zephyrs are. The Zephyrs refers refers to an organization that Queen Alyssa founded centuries ago. Um, well, that's that's actually a bit of an exaggeration. It's more like a century ago, a century and a half ago. Uh, specifically to use them as a force for diplomacy. It was basically her requirement. If you want to be a vassal state of ki the Kingdom of Alluvia, 
you're going. This is this is in the treaty. This is in the terms and conditions. So the, she created and trained, as I mentioned earlier, all of these fairies in ar the art of diplomacy and that's whatnot. And they've kept that going ever since. The Zephyrs uh, have been interacting even to this day. And I'll talk more about them later when it becomes relevant in the history. The other vassal state is Eastham. Now Eastham's kind of funny, because the more I wrote about it, the more I realized I was just kind of describing the idealized Shire in uh, Lord of the Rings, so whatever, I'll just admit it. It's basically the Shire. The hob the halflings live there. You'll notice I didn't even mention the halflings in my uh, species list. That's because there's not really anything to say other than hobbits. They don't care about what's going on in the rest of the world. They don't want to leave their home. They're perfectly content having problems like, what do I want to eat tonight? And, oh my goodness, I have an itch on my foot. And they are f excellent excellent farmers. They produce the best uh, produce and general goods, and basically their deal with the Kingdom of Alluvia is, we will give you this piece of land, which is actually quite large. This is yours. We will defend it. We will, ke we will keep its borders, and we will leave you completely alone, and you will give us your surplus food stock. And that's the deal. It is also worth noting that the best pipeweed comes from Halfling. Now, let me define something for really quick for anybody out there who is enough of a geek to be like, aha. Those of you who don't know, uh, pipeweed in Lord of the Rings is actually tobacco. They specifically, he specifically used the term pipeweed because tobacco felt like too modern of a term for the fantastical setting. But it was tobacco, okay? In my setting, contrarily, t tobacco is not pipeweed and vice versa. Pipeweed actually has no chemically addictive properties whatsoever. It is literally just an herb that you can smoke that calms you. It is not uh, marijuana. I know, that because one guy just would not shut up about that, and it kind of started irritating me after a while. It is simply an herb that calms you slightly. After a while of using it, you probably will have a mental addiction to it, but not a chemical addiction to it, if you understand what I mean by that. I just felt like putting that out there. Um... Next, uh, okay, so next thing, um, I guess we'll go on to the next nation. That would be, let's go ahead and go with the show empire, because I haven't talked about them all that much. The party, none of the party has ever gone to two of the nations still. The show empire, as I mentioned, are extremely traditionalist to the point of ridiculousness. They haven't advanced basically at all. The fact that they have airships at all is because they were gifted the technology by the mites, who didn't understand the idea of not gifting technology to everybody. Um... And the only reason they built them was because some of the counts, which are the, which are uh, leaders of uh, basically state leaders within the the or the show empire, f just said, "Okay, we need airships." And the show military pushed for it and pushed for it and pushed for it until finally they said, "Okay, fine." So the show military has almost no airships whatsoever, or yeah, um, the show military also lost the most during the incursion. I'll mention that later. The Sho Empire is extremely rigid and conformalist. conformist. For example, let's say you join the military. Let's say you arise to the rank of A, okay? Now, as the moment you hit rank A, the day you hit rank A, there is basically a timer that says, t you know, a number of years from that point in time, you will retire unless you rank up. It, and it is not very likely you will rank up, by the way, not unless you really are ambitious or skilled or something. If you do rank up, you get a new timer that is based on the new rank, because all given ranks can only serve for a set period of time. Doesn't matter if they want to stay. Doesn't matter if they would like to stay. It's tough. This is, the, this is how we do things. This is tradition. That basically revol is the entire show empire in a nutshell. I hate to summarize it so. The problem is the show sit on a massive bed of resources and have a ridiculously powerful naval fleet which also means they also have a ridiculously extensive mer merchant fleet on the on the the east coast there. They the show empire probably does more uh sea-based trade than the other three nations combined. And they use that massive wealth and the ever-present threat of their huge naval fleet to basically say, "Yep, and keep balance with the other three nations." Honestly, I don't have much else to say about them. Uh they are run by an emperor. I suppose I'll go down the ranks, because I did that with the Alluvians. Uh, they're run by the Emperor. Underneath the Emperor is the Marquise. 
who basically are actually nothing more than glorified uh, servants for the emperor, to be completely frank with you. And then there are the counts and countesses who actually run these specific provinces, uh, very similar to the, the alluvian thing there. Underneath them are dukes or duchesses, and those are actually the ones who are in charge of uh, regions, basically. And then under them are the comtis, who actually uh, run towns and so forth and so on. Ah. Unfortunately, I'm not going to pronounce the, the show military names because I'm not very good with Persian. <laughs> Moving along. So, then we, we'll go ahead and do the Osteth Republic next. I mentioned earlier that they are basically, they're a representative, repu representative republic that is extremely democratic on top of that. I kind of already went over that, but I just wanted to re-emphasize it just in case anybody is zipping to this point. Any given individual does have a say. How much that say matters varies, of course, but you can go to any given representative and say, look, and they'll say, oh, okay. The Osteth is run by the Titus, who actually, effectively, despite the Republic thing I just mentioned, is for all intents and purposes a supreme commander. He also happens to be the uh, head leader of the military. He holds the title of Praetor, on addition, in addition to his title of Titus. He uh, has to play this interesting balancing act. I'll talk about why in a moment. But beneath him is the Extus, who run specific, uh, excuse me, specific branches of the government, you know, the bureaucracy in this section, or the economy, or the military, or whatever. Underneath them are, of course, the Giguses. There aren't that actually many of them. Underneath them are the Lithos, and then the Obelisks, and so forth and so on. Who uh, this is basic equivalent here, you know, regional town, etc. I mentioned uh, the balancing act that Titus has to do. Actually, every single member of the Osteth uh, government and military has to. Here's how the Osteth work. It is a meritocracy for all intents and purposes. In other words, you will only be advanced in rank if you prove it through merit. And you also have to have the ambition to do so as well. You have to prove that you're good enough to get to advance in rank through action, through results. And then you have to actually want to advance in rank. And that is true for everything, for companies, for corporations, for little donut shops on the street corner, and of course, the military and the government. And that's one of the reasons why the people, when they vote will vote based on their actions. When someone goes on a campaign, you know, I'm, I'm going to run for the local gigas, they don't say, oh, I'm going to petition for, you know, lower taxes. They say, this is what I have done, dot, dot, dot. And they will list their accomplishments, and they will be required to prove that they have done those accomplishments to some degree or another. I mean, obviously, you can't prove everything. Um, or have people who will witness or vouch for their accomplishments in order to prove that they have done them. And generally whoever has the most accomplishments or the accomplishments that are most relevant will win. You understand where I'm going with this? But again, only the people who want to advance will do so. It is entirely possible for someone who has no rank or status to have greater accomplishments than someone who does, but because he has no interest in advancing, he never will, because he'll never try. They will never try to force position on you, if you understand what I mean. Unlike the Neveri, which I'll get to in a minute here. Ah, no. Last thing about the uh, Osteth. This is, I, I wanted to mention this here because it's part of their government and their nation, as well as their culture as of the Lugians. The Osteth Republic is something along the lines of 70% Lugians. It is by far the largest concentration of a single race within any of the four nations, any of the nations, period, for that matter. The only other races that have permanent settlements there uh, in any reasonable numbers, I mean, obviously there's going to be all types of races here, but the only real relevant ones are the gnomes and the mites. That probably doesn't surprise you at all. Uh, the only place that the mites might actually consider a home, as far as a nation goes, is the Osteth Republic. But the Lugians, being so predominant, basically run the culture there because of... because duh, right? The Lugian clans and the Lugians, uh, professionally, both, basically play the same game with each other. I mentioned the meritocracy thing. In general, it is incumbent upon any given Lugian to prove... Uh, to, they get very competitive, is actually kind of how I want to start this sentence. They want to prove that they're better than their 
others that they are superior. They do not want to do so through trickery because that would be, you know, that would be defeating the point. You would actually not be doing anything if you just try to pretend to do something. Does that make sense? Now, obviously, there are going to be exceptions, but, you know, this is the vast majority here. So Lugians basically play, a, it's almost a sport uh, with each other, where they will constantly try to one-up one another through actions. And it creates a very competitive atmosphere, and it's probably one of the reasons why the Lugians are so massively progressive and have been leaping forward as far as both magical and technological innovations, uh, especially ever since the treaty with Alluvia. By the way, Alluvia and Osteth are allies, true, full, solid allies. They are the only nations that have ever made such a commitment to each other. Just thought I'd mention that. So let's move on to the littler places. Uh, let's talk about Collier next, actually. I mentioned it uh, briefly before, and frankly, I kind of mentioned everything I really needed to, but let's just go over it again really quick. Collier is the Drudge Nation. Uh, it is quite small, all things considered. It has Collier itself, the city, and several towns and cities within the surrounding area. It is on the northern end of the Inner Sea. It has uh, a access to a great deal of resources within the area, and they are le looking to expand, all things considered. They have been doing very well for themselves, and Collier is considered something of a safe haven for basically everyone, including you-know-whats, which I'll get to uh, pretty much dead last, second to dead last, actually. The, uh, the drudges are, of course, the 99 percentile of the population there, but anybody is welcome in Collier, like I said. And there is a huge amount of trade that goes through Collier because, not that many people would want to admit this, the Stonehold area and the Four Nations actually do a great deal of trade with each other. It's just all under the board. And pretty much all of it at this point goes through Collier, so they have a decent amount of tariff wealth that comes through there as well. Uh, next, let's talk about Stonehold. I'm going to tell you very, very little about Stonehold because, again, this is from the perspective of a standard player. Or, you know, standard citizen of the, f of the Four Nations or something like that. Those. Stonehold is the term that refers to the confederacy that is consisted of all the uncivilized races that exist within a fairly large region in the far northwest corner of the continent, pretty segregated from everyone else. And that's the end of that sentence. Um, I'm also going to mention now Central. Central is the Olthoi uh, land. That's what they call it, Central. Basically, non-Ulthoi are not allowed in Central. Uh, there have been exceptions, but those exceptions have never talked about it because they were sworn not to. So that is, again, the end of this sentence. I have nothing to tell you about Central other than the fact that it is actually uh, blocked off by mountains on all sides except for a single pass, which the Ulthoi guard rather considerably, as you might imagine. And in case you're wondering, yes, the Ulthoi do guard all of the mountain chain as well because they are very serious about keeping people out of their lands, for whatever reason. Uh, then we have the Derekost. The Republic of Derekost. Now, most people know basically nothing about the Republic of Derekost. There's only one thing they really know about them. They are way more advanced, magically and technologically, than everyone else. They exist in the Dyers. Now, the reason that's relevant I'll get into later. But do keep that in mind. Uh, actually, that's basically the next thing I'm going to talk about. But they exist within the Dyers. That is their home. And it's called the Dyers for a reason. That uh, Honestly, that by itself explains everything I could ever explain about the, the Derekost. They also... Uh, mm, for many, many years, up until a century ago, where a significant event happened, I'll get to that in the history, had a very heavy hand and very significant role in shaping the fate of the Four Nations. When that finally stopped, uh, which it did a century ago, well, let's just say the Derekost have been completely absent from politics and from the world scene basically ever since. And for the most part, contact with the Derekost has tapered off to the point where the only ones who see them at all are the traders who actually ply across the inner sea to the Weizhou and uh, hit the port city, and they'll usually only even see lycanthropes, because, you know, working the docks and all that. So, oh my goodness. Working my way through this here, working my way through this. Geography. Now, I actually do have a map, which I could just link you, but screw that! Um, 
there is very little green plains terrain except for the area around uh, mo much of Alluvia. The show area, for example, is very amber, rugged plains. The uh, almost half of Navari is dominated by a vast desert and uh, rugged rocks, that kind of thing. They mostly get their wealth through gems and minerals, that kind of a thing. The most of the t terrain has been thought up in my head, uh, and I do mean terrain not just in the sense of the, lo the vast sense, but in smaller sense as well. But you know, I can't summarize that to you, so forgive me. But Osteth primarily exists within a mountain chain. Show primarily exists within the, the flood plains and the amber plains. The Neveri primarily exists within the rugged, rocky uh, barrens and the this desert. And Alluvia exists within the green, grassy area. In the northeast, there is that mountain chain I mentioned, which completely segregates central. And in the northwest, far corner, is Stonehold. The north-central part of the continent is dominated by an area that is known only as Crater. Now, there is a crater there, a massive crater, bigger than any that exists in real life Earth, to give you an idea. Uh, obviously, nobody has any idea what caused that crater, but that whole area is unsettled. It is very inhospitable, it is very rocky, the terrain is extremely rough, it is very cold, and there are very significant threats uh, in terms of creatures, monsters, etc., and just plain beasts, Not never mind the weather and the terrain, throughout all of the crater region. However, it is pretty much untouched by everybody. There is also the Inner Sea, which exists... Uh, it, it, it's funny, when I very first drew out a rough sketch of the map and showed it to my players, their immediate reaction was, that was magically augmented, because that doesn't happen naturally. And I just laughed, because they, they figured that out within three seconds of me showing it. There is a huge chunk of land that has basically been grafted onto the west chunk of the continent, uh, the southwest chunk of the continent. That chunk of land is known as the Dyers. I'll actually be talking about that last. I'm just mentioning it because the sea in between the Dyers and the rest of the continent is known as the Inner Sea. Now that's actually a fairly tranquil, calm sea, and a huge amount of trade goes up and down the eastern coast of it. And of course, some trade goes from the east coast to the Weiju you know, over on the Dyers, which is where the Derekost are. There are two very, very thin land bridges, only a couple miles wide, actually, uh, that connect the Dyers to the rest of the continent. Um, like I said, I'll mention the Dyers last. There is another continent. I mentioned this way back. It's called Aburian. This other continent and its name are basically all I'm going to tell you about it. Many, many attempts have been made to reach it, catalog it, discuss it, all sorts of things, right? In recorded history, 350 years, no one has ever returned from Aburian. Now, to fully emphasize this point, allow me to elucidate a little bit here. Obviously, people sent sailing ships early on. Then people sent magicite ships when that technology exists. Then people sent military magicite ships when that technology exists. Then people sent airships. Then people sent a squad of military airships. Do keep in mind that I mentioned how few airships exist in my setting, because they are that rare and that difficult and that costly to make. None of those have ever come back. It is also worth noting that many, many individuals, either explorers or adventurers or people who are crazy, you know, just all sorts of people, uh, have attempted solo journeys out there. No, none of them have ever been heard from again either. One last thing before I get into the next section. There is an entire huge chunk of land, which is roughly the size of, mm, I'd say, the entire country of Mexico. Uh, if you were to put it into basically a single chunk, so that's not a, like a little smaller than Bra Brazil, I'd say. No, that's too big. Um, I think Mexico's pretty accurate. Whatever. Uh, maybe Germany would be accurate. Whatever. I, I know the space on the actual map. It's a huge chunk of land. And it is in, it is in between, on the eastern coast, uh, Alluvia to the north and Sho to the south. Oh, by the way, the four nations form basically uh, quadrants. Nor Alluvia to the northeast, Navari to the northwest, Osteth to the southwest, and Sho to the north e southeast. It's not perfect, but that's just the general positioning there. There is a huge chunk of land that is in between Sho and Alluvia, and also kind of pushes a little bit into Navarre, that is known as the Dry Reach Zone. I'll talk about that in more detail later. I just felt like mentioning it here. Finally, the Dyers. 
Very little knowledge exists about the dyers, but I'm going to share one little thing with you. The combined forces of Alluvia, Navarre, Sho, and Osteth formed basically a separate organization, a separate military group that doesn't actually have a name. They specifically decided not to have a name to avoid nationality concerns or worries about loyalism or anything like that. This organization's entire purpose, it's, it's pure military, 100%, is to defend those land bridges I mentioned earlier. You may ask, well, why? Because every now and again, something from the Dyers tries to leave the Dyers. Now, that may not sound like a horrible thing, but I'm going to describe two creatures that exist within the Dyers later. Tuskers and Grievers. Actually, three. Uh, tuskers, Golems, and Grievers. And that is actually next. So I'm just going to kind of blur the creatures section, which I'm going to go ahead and start the timestamp for now. Two, four, two, there we go. Uh, golems I will talk about last because I have the most to say about them, but Tuskers are large, strong, ridiculously fast, and did I mention really, really strong? Like the Hulk level strong creatures. Um, very thick fur, very thick skin underneath the fur. They have large tusks, that's what gives them their names. And they can barrel around on their arms and legs, and they are stupidly agile. A Tusker can twist his body in ways that probably shouldn't actually be possible. Tuskers exist in the Dyers. And then there's Grievers. Now, this is the really big point, okay? Those fortresses I mentioned, Fort Tethania, there's actually three, but there are three fortresses out there. I have Fort Tethania is the only one whose name I remember. That entire fortress, consisting of thousands of soldiers, and also having airship and support, you know, embattlements, Ma mages, you, you name it. They, this is basically the the most powerful military force that exists within the nation, within the the setting, right? Uh, with one exception, these fortresses, every now and again, will see a single griever approach, and the entire fortress has a specific alarm for grievers. If a griever approaches, the entire fortress, the entire fortress, is rallied. Every single man, woman, well, just man and woman, uh gets a weapon of some kind, and they will all fight it as one. They will not kill it. They will eventually, hopefully, drive it back. Did I mention that's with military airship support? And that was one griever? I forgive me if I'm overemphasizing this, but I really want to get across the point. Several of my players truly understand what the what a terror and a nightmare a griever is supposed to be. It is one of the main reasons that several every any time the subject of going to the dyers is brought up, it's immediately shot down. No, if for absolutely no other reason, if we ever even see a griever, we are already too close to it and we're dead. <laughs> Grievers are massively huge you know, dozens of feet tall creatures that stand on multiple legs, usually uh, about a dozen or so legs. These legs look very thin and very sheety, like they're actually made of metal or something. It's actually a carapace type thing. They come out, they have multiple joints. They have uh, seven joints along each of these legs, and they terminate in a ridiculously sharp point at where the foot would be. And they kind of skitter along on these dozen uh, feet, if you could even call them that, dozen legs. The middle part of the creature, it it, term, it calls, comes up to the middle, and then there is a the creature kind of hangs down from the middle chunk. I don't even know how to describe that, and has this very crystalline uh, structure to it, which I'm I'm forgive me for describing poorly, but it's like if you can imagine just solid quartz mixed with ink. Like if you had poured a, a, a octopus ink into a quartz and it just kind of mixed in there and then solidified, that's what you're seeing in the middle of this creature. Obviously, again, dozens of feet tall. It is also worth noting that it can regrow its legs almost at will. And any one of those points at the end I mentioned, if it feels like it, and it can, it can raise up the leg and that leg can become an arm. The the uh, the point I mentioned at the very end of the seventh joint will actually sheath back, and it will reveal what is effectively uh, a large number of digits with ha which have several 
uh, knuckles on them and can be can, can rotate in all directions and it can grab and manipulate. And of course, every single one of those fingers also terminates in a very sharp point. These things, th no one in, in recorded history has ever killed a griever. So, golems. <laughs> Let's get off of that horrifying subject, shall we? Uh, where is the golem write-up? Because I did a whole write-up. Here we go. I'm actually just going to read my golem write-up, if you'll forgive me, because I actually did a very specific write-up uh, for the party at one point in time. Golems are entities that are magically created from a given substance. The type of substance has direct proportion to how difficult the golem is to make, how powerful, and how durable it is. To date, even the most skilled of artisans can weave only up to sand golems. A golem is a force to be reckoned with. Um, it is a form of continuous weaving. Its very existence is specially designed to, without ceasing, re-weave itself to be able to approximate sentience in order to understand and carry out orders with no particular limit on complexity. By its very nature as a magical creation, a golem can understand all forms of communication. That includes non-verbal, -ver uh, by the way. A golem's heart is the thing that keeps a golem concentrated. A golem whose heart is removed is still technically alive, as much as a golem is ever alive, but lacks the ability to manipulate the substance it was constructed of. The heart thus has to be removed with extreme care, as it would require injuring the body of the golem to the point where it has low enough in defenses for the heart to be removed without significant force. The golem heart is not fragile, per se, as it would actually be very, very difficult to destroy, but even a miter change in it while transporting it would require the heart to be repaired, a very lengthy and complex process, since that is basically what the golem is. The known golems that the modern age can create, from weakest to strongest, are mud, water, wood, ice, and sand. All of these have been reverse-engineered from studies based on the mites uh, from feral golems, which we will talk about momentarily. Feral golems... Uh, okay, feral golems go upwards from that. They're, they can also include mud, water, wood, ice, and sand. However, they can also include granite, bronze, iron, magma, coral, gold, diamond, platinum, crystal, and, heaven forbid, pyreal. Any given do golem can manipulate its body, quote-unquote, to an almost infinite degree, such that it can handle heavy objects just as easily as small and delicate items, because it can apply a pressure with near-infinite control. Thus, a massive pyreal golem could actually manipulate that pyreal to morph around a very delicate glass uh, uh, statue, for example, and lift it without, without even scuffing the statue because of the sheer level of control the golem has over itself. Any golem is at all times at risk of going feral. No one is completely sure what exactly what causes it, and it is incredibly rare, less than a hundredth of a percent of the time. However, the concept of any go golem going feral is a very real risk that is always run. Some people have theorized that this is why no stronger than sand golems have bothered to be researched yet, because nobody wants to see what an iron golem going feral in the middle of a city would do. Feral golems are at once insanely dangerous and easy to control because they will stay wherever they went feral at, guarding that area and a chunk of the area around of it. They will attack anything and everything that approaches on site without question or hesitation or communication. That includes anything living whatsoever. Animals, bugs, creatures, people. But they will never pa pa venture past their designated area. Golems also have the innate ability to see through stealth and cloaking, just as part of their existence. Now one final thing. I mentioned earlier something about the Order that I want you to mention here. The Order is one of the only organizations that creates golems commercially and sells them. Golems are ridiculously useful as, as labor force, but obviously they are also ridiculously expensive. However, the Order does make a stupid amount of money selling golems to people who actually can afford it. Uh, either really, really, really rich people, or, more accurately and more commonly, uh, you know, peop uh, corporations that actually want heavy lifters for whatever reason. Alright, now let, we're going to take a little bit of a detour, because these two segments, I didn't know where else to put them. First, let's talk about sailing. This is about sailing and adventuring, okay? In most settings in D&D, adventuring is kind of the superstars of the setting, right? Even in Faerun, where adventure, the entire economy of the entire world is based on adventuring. Still, if you're an adventurer, you're an adventurer. In my setting, this is not so. 
adventuring is basically dying out in my setting and has been for many years as more and more corporations, mercenary companies, and military uh, groups basically just take over the work of the adventurers. There's just been less and less for them to do. Now, the Adventurer's Guild still exists, but it is literally within a few years of collapsing if things go the way they keep going. And I guess that's really all I have to say about that. I just mentioned that because playing an adventurer within this setting is truly being a rarity. You are someone who is not only picking something that is uncommon, but unpopular, and may not actually pay well, if you understand what I mean, compared to the alternative. Now, sailors are the exact opposite of that. In my setting, sailing is being a sailor, being skilled at sailing, is, is basically being a superstar. There is a tremendous amount of cultural clout and prestige from being a sailor, from being on a vessel, knowing how to run it. I actually did a whole write-up, like several page write-up, based just about sailing. Uh, I will not summarize it here for you. I, that's, that's from a cultural perspective, from a setting perspective, I just wanted to mention that. It is also worth noting that uh, sailor sailing is so... It's, it's a big deal, but obviously it's not being flooded with people because A, it's a hard life, and B, even if it level, several people join it, not many will advance within it. But by the same token, not many people want to. It is also worth noting that there is a very distinct difference between working on a magicite ship, working on a sailing ship, and working on an airship, all of which require different skill sets, well, with some exceptions, obviously. You know, obviously, swabbing a deck is swabbing a deck, right? But um, there are specific career paths you can pursue as well. And in general, for example, several people want to get to the point where they are they work their way up to being a navigator or a helmsman on an airship. That's like the pinnacle uh, career thing. But I say that's the pinnacle. That's actually a lie. There's there's one other pinnacle career pass, and you're going to laugh at it before. It's a sailman. It's the guy who manages the sails on the ship. Uh, there is actually a specific job in real life uh, that I was actually talking with a uh, friend of mine who was in the Navy. Um, and I, and I, I've mentioned before, I know a, a fair amount about na uh, naval concepts myself. But anyways... These people's job is tending, working, and functioning, and everything to do with the sales, basically. It is their job, 100%. And in general, once you become a salesman, A, you're making tons of money, and B, you're set. You've, you've, you've peaked. You've hit the head, head of your career. And so it is not uncommon to find salesmen who, for whatever reason, you know, if they lost a ship or if something else went wrong, they can they will go to any given town if they want to keep working and usually they do and they can command just about any price they want because most people who are sailmen even if they just started being a sailman for the last you know year or so or months even in order to even reach that point have been a sailor for years upon years you understand so very much uh, there's this whole prestige uh, advancement thing within that that I won't bore you completely about but like I said I just wanted to go over that now <sighs> Next subject, very important subject, and some people have probably wondered why I haven't covered it yet. Desolation. There is a condition within my setting known as desolation. The most recent incident of the... I'm sorry, the oldest... Sorry, wrong direction. The oldest known recorded incident of this was a banderling. He was a mayor, actually, and he was the mayor of a town for some months in Navarre. I never talked about Navarre in my nations. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, uh, okay, I'm going to pause to talk about the Navarre Confederacy, because I can't not talk about that. The Navarre Confederacy is a confederacy. It's several states, uh, which are united under a single flag for purposes of being dealt with as an external uh, unit. They have a unique political system in that it is at, the, at once a dictatorship and an absolute democracy. Within a town is the best way I can explain this. Within a given town, every single member of that town, including children, uh, down to, uh, I believe, age eight, I decided, has a vote. In other words, eight years, eight years old and up, has a vote in who is going to be the mayor of that town. Now, once the mayor is elected, that mayor, he or she, has absolute power. However, if the mayor does things that the town does not like, they can replace him at any time because absolute democracy, and at the same time, absolute dictatorship. So any given leader has to do a very interesting balancing act between being in command, total command, and 
at the same time keeping everybody happy. And I do mean everybody, or at the very least the majority. I mentioned earlier that the Neveri can force you in charge, rather it's the Austin they can't. It is considered your duty. If the, if seventy percent of the people vote and say you, you're now the mayor, you don't really have you don't have the option to say no. You have been voted in. You are now the mayor. Congrats. Enjoy the responsibility. That has happened on many occasions where someone is very popular and very well liked, and and you know a good merchant, for example, a merchant who is very well liked and very uh, prestigious within the people, and the people will vote him. Okay, you know what? We want you to be our new mayor. And he doesn't want to be the new mayor, but oh well, <laughs> you know. So it's an interesting system that works all the way up to every single member of a state has a cho has a choice, a way to vote for who actually is in charge of that particular state. And obviously, uh, you know, the governor, by the way, governor of that state, there's obviously uh, a degree of, a huge degree of politics here that I'm kind of glancing over, but that's because I really shouldn't even be talking about this just yet. Um... The other interesting thing is the Navarre military is, for all intents and purposes, a completely separate entity from the Navarre government. The military obviously is, to, you know, is is from people from Navarre and people who are interested in taking care of Navarre. But for all intents and purposes, they don't actually answer to the governors. The only ones they answer to are the. Uh, oh shoot! Let me actually pull up the title here. Give me just a moment. Uh, Navarre, Navarre. The council members, uh, not even the prime minister himself, who, who is basically, for all intents and purposes, a figurehead, by the way. The council members do have theoretical control over the military, but even the distributors who are in charge of region, regionals of states, and then the governors who are you know in charge of states, don't actually have the authority to order around uh, the military. They can, or they can say, but usually it's considered polite and, uh, well, required to basically say, I have an issue over here, please deal with it, instead of, go deal with this, if you understand the difference there. Now, usually the military will do that, but if you ask wrong, or if you don't have a good enough reason, you know, uh, then they are not obliged to answer you. The military answers to itself. Moving on. Sorry about the the segue there. I just I'm an idiot. Over to desolation. Okay, so a Navarre mayor, who obviously was very popular because he was voted in, um, it was a banderling. I named him at one point. Forgive me. I think it's Mioka or something like that. He was running his town. Uh, I believe it was 39 years prior to now. I should pull up the timeline because history is the next and last thing I'll be talking about here. Give me just one moment, please. <laughs> yep, 39 years ago. The mayor, uh, Nuka, that was right, was taking care of his town and, and just doing his thing as usual. Now, this guy was in his 30s, and obviously was well-known and well-liked enough to become a mayor. But by chance, a fairy happened to visit. Now, I actually forgot to mention this earlier, but fairies have the innate ability to see the elements, which I'll... Shoot, I haven't discussed the elements. I'll do that next. The fairies have the innate ability to see elemental energy, right? That also means they could see something that doesn't have elemental energy. That is the best description of what a desolate is. They lack elemental energy. Now, when I now that may not mean much. Everything has elemental energy in it, even n inanimate objects. But every living thing is crafted from elemental energy within this setting. Thus, the desolates are viewed as abominations because they are not alive by the general description of what alive should be, if you understand what I mean. Now, nobody knows how people become desolate. Nobody knows what spreads desolation, if anything. But cases have been becoming more and more common and more and more frequent uh, within the public over the last 39 years. It is known that there is a town somewhere, nobody, nobody knows where, called Segregate. Segregate is home of the desolates. It is where all the desolates seek to go in many cases. Uh, like I said, nobody knows where it is, uh, at least commonly. And basically, how do I put this? Okay, not only are desolates viewed as monsters and abominations, but there is actually another element to that. That not elemental energy I mentioned actually makes it so that any given individual 
basically has to exert will to not hate them on sight. In game terms, if you encounter a desolate and you are not one, you have to roll a will save. If you fail at that will save, congratulations, you hate that person. And I will make you roleplay that. You understand where I'm going with this? So, there are cases where children are thrown out on the streets, or thrown out of towns to basically fend for themselves. There are cases where babies are left to fend for themselves. There are cases where people who have been friends with people for years are outed and have to be removed from violently from the situation. The only reason people have not sought out Segregate to destroy it is because the general concept is it's the monster town. So let them all live with the rest of the monsters. Desolation is a very serious issue, especially since it's been getting worse. There are a very very small number of people who are working to work with desolates and to deal with desolation. It is known that certain races have a much higher tolerance for desolation than others. Olthoi, Mites, and uh, Drudges are all on that list. It is also worth noting that uh, basically um, People who are seen as trying to cure desolation or help desolates are basically ridiculed, is kind of where I want to go with that. They are not really called good names, and they're just kind of, yeah, whatever. You go ahead and play your little games, you little weirdo. Curing desolation. But it is worth noting that the number of people who have been trying to cure desolation or work with desolation or anything along those lines have been increasing lately. And the reason why should be pretty obvious if you think about it. Because desolation has been getting worse. And there's a very real threat, from a very real problem that some people have been acknowledging that, you know, at some point in time, there may be too many desolates to everyone else, and we can't have that happening, can we? And you get the general point I'm going across here. That's desolation. I, I unfortunately don't have much else to add. That is because... Anything else I would have to say about desolation, you don't know about, if you understand where I'm going with that. No, I said, oh god, I, hang on, let me add another thing here. I'm going to only talk about this briefly, really, really briefly, honestly. There is, this world is basically elemental in its nature. There are eight elements. And all eight of them interact with each other in ways they're not necessarily contradictory. You know, fire does not necessarily contradict water any more than space does life. Um, they all weave together in, to make a pattern, which is basically uh, how everything exists. There we go. So, uh, let's just go over the elements really quick here. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my post, uh, because this is going to be an excellent way to summarize what I'm about to say. Give me just one moment, please. Let's start, let's just go down the list here, okay? Air. Air is those who embody... Uh, okay, actually, I'm going to take a step back here. Let's just talk about the elements first. Air, fire, earth, water, light, dark, life, and spatial, okay? Now, these are the eight elements. Many, just about... Uh, no, not just about. Everything, with the exception of desolates, like I just mentioned, is created with the elemental energy, either in combination or primarily of one of these elements. Mm, I'd say about 30% of all living sentient beings have a specific affinity for one element. That also affects their personality. This, is, Whenever I have a player do this, I tell them, okay, this is a choice. You don't have to have an affinity. But if any of these elements fit you then go ahead and choose it. It's basically a role-playing thing. Because the idea here is that someone who is of air, who is affinity of air, was born with more air elemental energy than anything else. You follow me? And so they tend to think in an air manner. Now, now I'm going to go over the list and, and tell you what that means. Air, like I just said, is those who embody freedom. Um, for some reason, they can be considered by others to be flighty or sometimes chaotic. It can sometimes be considered to be a trying experience dealing with an heir. However, heirs are good-natured, friendly folk who have no problems with travelers or strangers. They also have a tendency towards giving and sharing, which makes them often uh, the kind of people who would either give feasts or gifts, that kind of a thing. Um, they 
basically have a huge uh, concept of the, the, the freedom of choice, and that's how I'm going to summarize that, and I'm going to move on now. Fire. The people of fire are passionate. Do not be confused with the energetic nature of air. Fires rather put their entire heart and being into a thing, whether it be their job, their art, their family, their loved ones, their friends. Whatever function of life a fire is engaged in, they do so fully. This tends to lead to the trend that fires, uh, people say that fires tend to think with their hearts and with their heads, but fire, that's not actually true. It's more like a fire would ne would rather take the, the licks and take the punishment than refuse to do what it is they care about because they are passionate. Similarly, uh, fires are not hot-headed idiots. In any given c circumstance, it is simply that an average fire will go with their instinct and their gut quickly rather than sit and consider a situation at length. Earth. Earth has two extremes. Stalwart, determined, stubborn, stability, structure, f and a constant state of flux. The idea of being a shifting, unusual mentality, which at the same time also is contrasted by the total stability. And that's ironic when you actually think about it. Um, in more than many occasions, an individual will actually flip between these two mentalities, uh, sometimes more than, sometimes rather frequently. Earth also tends to believe in the concept of tradition tempered with experience. Um, Earth are also most uh, generally the most happy with of the eight uh, of, of eight affinities, with things being unchanging in their lives. Having a general static routine that doesn't really change can be very comforting to an Earth person. Water. Those amongst water are inherently unstable, flowing naturally from one thought mindset or emotion to the next. This change is never abrupt. It is never sudden. It is not craziness. This is not insanity we are talking about here. It is simply a slow shift over time, usually over hours, months, even years. Wowers, waters also innately seek to establish themselves amongst others, either in a societal or perceived manner, or whatever it is that happens to work within that. For example, I mentioned earlier the Lugians game with each other. A water affinity Lugian will work even harder than any other Lugian, specifically to make sure that they are the best, that everyone sees all the things that they do and all the th the merits that they have to their name. So waters are very slow to anger. However, they have the most horrifying temper if it actually does happen. Light. Light is energy. While not necessarily to the extreme of being hyper, someone who is of light is energetic in all that they do, from the mundane to the fantastical. They prefer action to thought, motion to rest, and results to theories. A light is not necessarily reckless, but nonetheless is way more inclined to simply do rather than consider possibilities or alternatives before doing. Metaphorically, a light never seems to run out of energy uh, and takes great joy in exercising that energy. Dark. Darkness is the calm stillness. Those of dark are quiet, peaceful, thoughtful, and wise. A dark will carefully consider any and all actions to be taken until they are satisfied before taking action. But do not mistake this for procrastination, laziness, or a sedentary nature. A dark will act. They just prefer to look before they leap. They also prefer th things to be quiet, low, still, and tranquil. Life. Life is optimism incarnate, the inherent belief that all things happen for a reason, and that reason is good, the desire to do no ill towards another, nor cause by action or inaction another to stumble in their lives, whether that be on a Monday, everyday level, or to the severity of their own existence. Life, by their nature, are idealistic, almost unrealistically, but ultimately strive in their own ways to better their lives and the lives of all around them, believing that everything should be given its chance to nurture and grow. Spatial. Those of spatial are oddities, unusual people who think outside of the box and have a mindset that could be described as alien to others of their kind. It is hard to put a finger on any given quality of spatial other than one very specific thing. Spatials tend to have great ambitions, and they often tend to put the needs of others before their own. Do not mistake this with life and the way that life tends to try to strive to better themselves and others. Spatial, by contrast, will specifically put another before themselves, and in so doing be self-sacrificing towards that end. Those are the eight elements. 
Now, obviously, they have other uh, things, including the elemental temples, which I could spend an entire video just describing the temples, so let's just move on from that. I will leave that for when the party actually reaches each individual temple. They've been to one so far. Let's get to the final segment here. The final countdown. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Dun -dun -dun -dun. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, let's pull up the timeline. Year zero. Year zero refers to when the calendar starts. It is well known that that is not when history began, that there were things before that. I have mentioned several of them during the course of this event. The city, the major cities were around, whatever the ancients were, uh, you, the viewer, know that these are the scions, were around before year zero. The order was around before year zero. The Derekost were around before year zero. All of these things have been around. All of these people were already here. In about the year 5 or 6, the Order took it upon itself to start to create a calendar and start notating history, and they went back as far as they had information on and remembered, back to Year Zero, and dubbed that Year Zero, the beginning of what I refer to as recorded history. Now let's actually r r step back a, bit, a little bit here. The eight elemental temples have been around since before that as well, and the order of the of the summoners has been taking care of those temples basically as long as is known. However, they never actually recorded history until the, men the time at which I mentioned. Therefore, there is nothing actually known about that. It is known that... Well, okay. The Derekost, as I mentioned, have been around for long before this. And they, in the early days, basically took a very direct hand in guiding the fate of all the people. This was before there even were nations. And basically helped to found the Kingdom of Alluvia, the Confederacy of Navarre, the Sho Empire, and the Osteth Republic. A little... well, okay. Many hundreds of years ago, there was an incident where... A loose band of Mosswarts under a warlord named Argmjarg took his people to the untamed lands to the northwest coast of Dareth. Over the years, they founded a home there within a primary fortress city which they called Stonehold. You can probably see where this is going. After a long time, all of the races which were not accepted by the others Mosswarts, Drudges, Kobolds, Goblins, Gnolls, Centaurs were all all just kind of migrated up there and joined in a, a very loose confederacy, which most people basically don't know anything else about, and I'm not going to tell you anything else about. 100 years ago, to the day, or to the year, I should say, there was a severe issue that was happening between the four nations, and they were, they were about to break out into open conflict when the Derekost intervened militarily and uh, politically and basically required the four groups to sit down and negotiate. The intervention did work, and there was a treaty that was signed between the four nations that, out, that stands to this day, outlining territories, rules of conduct, etc. This is when the states of Arwick and Eastham were formally recognized and given land under the Alluvian flag. This is also when the Articles of Prisoner Conduct, Proper Prisoner Conduct, were written, which I actually just mentioned very recently to the players. This is a significant event. I'm going to go ahead and mention this here. The Articles were written basically as a way of this is exactly how you should treat uh, individuals that are imprisoned for any reason. It is... Basically, to put it nicely, or to put it simply, in my setting, someone who is imprisoned is treated much, 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 much better than in real life. And it's all because of this article. The Confederacy of Stonehold refused to ratify this article for whatever reason. And as a result, let's just say that the Confederacy of Stonehold basically stopped being, stopped having formal contact with the Four Nations at this point in time. And the political and uh, cultural situation between the two has only gotten worse literally ever, ever since for the last century. I mentioned this already. 39 years ago was the first isolated case of desolation. The desolates have been getting more and more common ever since, and there is a very strong theory amongst people that just because that was the first time we saw desolation, that that does not mean that was when desolation began. Nobody to this day knows exactly what causes it. Now here's the part I've actually been waiting for this whole time. I've been very quiet about this this whole time. Forgive me. 
35 years ago would have been previously thought of as... Oh, I'm sorry. Hang on. I'm reading the wrong thing. I shouldn't even read that. I don't know why I'm reading this. I know what happened by heart. 35 years ago to the year, a horrifying incident happened. A group of species known as the Tumorocks showed up. The Tumorocks were tall, thin, furry uh, people. They had a uh, very deep violet to blue fur and vaguely mouse to cat-like features and long, uh, thin ears. The Tumorocks showed up and in three days conquered the swath of territory I mentioned earlier known as the Dry Reach Zone. There were no survivors from this incident. No one survived conflict with the Tumorock. And the only reason they stopped... Well, nobody knows, do they? I should say the only reason they were stopped is because they stopped. After three days, they had conquered a vast territory, and then they held it. In the years since, people have sent scouts, agents, adventurers, mages, all manner of things, ships, and sent them to try and infiltrate the Dry Reach Zone to figure out what's been going on there. None have ever come back. Five years after that, the, other, the nations who were in a state of n near panic for all five of those years were doing a violent militarization. This is actually when the Kingdom of Luvia began its militarization, was this event, because they lost quite a bit of territory, too. Um, the Alluvians and the Osteth formed a formal treaty between the two of them, basically binding the two nations together. And they started pooling resources together to pull this ridiculous level of money, time, resources, and personnel into we need better weapons and we need them now. This is where maglancers came from. This is where airships came from. Airships were things that were known from before, but these people actually went out and s sought out even fragments of the ruins of airships that they'd found from the previous or civilizations and spent countless man-hours studying them and trying to reverse-engineer them in order to understand how to make such terrifying weapons of destruction. I'm going to pause here to mention something. Since then, there have been airship, military airship incursions on the Tumorok. They have not come back either. Roughly 20 years ago is when Strongarm, the Drudge, banded his people together to form Collier. I mentioned that. Strongarm, this was a particularly interesting thing. I didn't mention this earlier because Strongarm specifically did this uh, at this point in time because the Drudges were very much forgotten in the flurry after the Tumorok attack, which by this point had finally started to die down. And many drudges found themselves bickering and turning inward because their resources and their materials and their capacity were all dwindling. Strongarm made them strong again, <laughs> no pun intended, and actually successfully managed to get them together and form the nation of Collier. Good on him. I would like to point out something actually really quick, just if you'll forgive me. There, uh, <laughs> there has never been war in recorded history. There have been occasional conflicts, but they have been minuscule. The Tumorok three-day devastation, the ball of destruction that just rolled over half the continent, that doesn't count. That's not war. There has never been war in recorded history. That is very important, and I'll get into why in a moment. A rogue faction of Lugians uh, during this period of time called themselves the Gotrok, which in their language means, uh, I'm trying to think of how best to put it, self-pride. They protested and eventually rebelled against the Republic of Ostas because they claimed that working with the non-Lugians, you know, bringing in the mites and the gnolls was bad enough, but actually working with elves and dwarves was just beneath them. Lugians should be with Lugians. Lugian solidarity. Um, they were they lost the conflict. It was a very brief rebellion. However, they were not executed or anything like that. They simply were banished. The survivors went into the dyers. A single year ago, prior to now, the year 348, 
the a Zephyr archaeological expedition into the Dyerlands, which had a full military escort, of course, undiscovered a huge, incredibly rich, untapped magicite vein near the Withered Atoll. That is actually where the Gotrok had basically ended up settling, by coincidence, quote-unquote. There is a combined Osteth and Elusian force which established a fortress in the area, Fort Candeth, and they have been basically fighting against the Gotrok for the last year, not just for the Magicite, but to get rid of the Gotrok, who have been using the Magicite to create new types of weapons which are not kind. Over the last five months, tensions between the show and the Nevere have grown excessively heated. The show in their traditionalism and stoicism, basically completely clash with the Neveri and their constant need to expand and be progressive. The, diplo the, sheer, the severe de democracy clashes with the imperialism of the show, and the two have actually had border skirmishes and the like. The only reason things have not gotten worse is the Zephyr, who I mentioned earlier, on the Balaf of Heluvia, have been making constant diplomatic missions to both nations, and the Olthoi have been putting forth extensive efforts into making sure that the two have, you know, peaceful coexistence through trade and discussion. The situation has managed to chill down significantly up until <laughs> January 1st and 4th of the year 349, which is basically when our adventure begins. On both of these days, there was a massive, magical backlash, a shockwave that hit the entire continent. This incident caused both the show and the Neveri, uh, in some cases it actually caused their border patrols to start combat, because they weren't sure what the heck to make of this event. Nothing like this has ever happened before. The, se the, the first incident made things bad, but however, the p there were diplomats already in place, in both cases unrelated, uh, who managed to smooth things over very quickly, but there was a great deal of undercurrent that one side or the other were engaging in illegal or horrifying experiments, and that was the result of one. And then the second shockwave hit, and that made things much, much worse. Now, there's one other historical thing I want to mention here, uh, because it has its own significance, and the party has not figured out why yet. Fifteen years ago, to prior to now, on January 25th, I believe, hundreds of thousands of green mages, summoners, across the whole of Dareth died. Instantly and mysteriously. Many, many people have done research and thought and and looked into this and tried to understand what happened and why and basically the only thing that ever came out of that was a guess that too many green mages had been allowed to congregate in small areas and that perhaps the excess of amount of aspectal aspectual energy which is concentrated elemental sentient energy was causing the, caused a feedback which caused the deaths therefore at that point in time, they instituted a new law, all four nations did, that green mages have to be registered, and they basically regulate how many green mages can be in any given city at any given point in time. That day, ever since, has been known as the Day of Remembrance. It's one of the only, and I do definitely put this in quote-unquotes, holidays, because obviously there's nothing you know joyful about this event, but every year, basically everyone celebrates, or I should say remembers, the Day of Remembrance and gives hom uh, homage and remembrance to the hundreds of thousands who died. And that brings us up to the current history. Oh my god, three hours. This is why I didn't want to do this. I may not even stream tonight now. It's already time to go. I think I lied to my people on Twitter. I'm sorry, guys. That is Dareth in a nutshell. I probably missed stuff. This is a massive setting. I have spent a huge amount of time building it. And to be honest with you, I am still filling in some of the gaps. Uh, kind of by design. I do that on purpose. Framework first, then detail. So, I do hope you enjoyed. And uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, listening to my future D&D blogs in the future. So, I'll talk to you guys later.